בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back at our uh, Wednesday shiur of uh, Stump the Rabbi. Bezot Hashem, you guys have some questions for me today uh, to uh, help Am Yisrael get some more chizuk. Today's shiur will be for a refuah shlema for Netanel Yosef ben Avraham, for Levana bat Sarah, Sarah bat Levana, Yosef ben Levana, Da, um, Ovadia ben Levana, uh, Doris bat Jora, David ben uh, Nesriya, um, Yochevet bat uh, Batia, Batia bat uh, Sara, um, Tzipora bat Esther, Esther bat Tzipora, and also for a Atzlacha uh, Raba and a Shiduch Agun for uh, Netanel Yosef ben Avraham and also our uh, sponsor, uh, Mazal Bat Roza, Shiduch uh, Agun. Each person will find not only the perfect person for them, but also for uh, a righteous person that uh, knows how to live the life that a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants us to. Uh, just a little bit of a uh, side note, um, updates. Uh, we have a couple of things going on right now, Baruch Hashem. Um, anyone that uh, is signed up to our website uh, got the newsletter, uh, I think it was last night. Uh, for the Hebrew speakers, anyone that uh, knows how to speak Hebrew and read and write Hebrew, you just got a uh, gold mine for free on our website, bezatashem.org. You can now download, uh, I believe it's eight or nine books that uh, Rav Ephraim, Rav Ephraim Kachlon, uh, wrote. Um, and you can download them for free. Some of the books are for serious Talmidei Chachamim. It's the Sheilot uh, Chuvot, Achtov Israel, the series, Aleph, Bet, and Gimel. And some of them are for uh, both Talmidei Chachamim and regular people. Doresh uh, Tov. I highly recommend Doresh Tov to anyone that's ever going to speak in public. Uh, not necessarily just people giving lectures, but anyone that's going to give a shiur or even a Dvar Torah on Shabbat. Doresh uh, Tov is a uh, you know couple of pages about every parasha in the Torah, uh, also a um, uh, commentary on every holiday, every simcha, and also every single masechet in the Gemara. Uh, so that's a uh, one of the books. Um, so that's uh, available for free. There's also some English books there on our website that you could download. Uh, one of them is about Kama Brit. Another one. Uh, uh, by uh, Rav Elchanan Wasserman, Allah uh, Shalom, Epic of Mashiach, the, uh, the End of Days. Is, uh, it's a very rel- relatively short book that was translated to English. It's about maybe 30, 40 pages. So highly recommend anyone that uh, has eyes uh, to uh, go on the website, bezotashem.org, and after you donate your life savings, you could, uh, uh, you could download the books. But even if you don't want to donate your life savings, you should still go read the books. Uh, and another note, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, we already announced this some time ago, but uh, always good to remind people. Uh, today, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is closing the store, meaning that we're in the end of days. Anyone that's uh, not living under a rock knows it. All the things that are going on in the world, you see there's a, uh, all of the leaders of the world are... Uh, constantly fighting about something, whether it's economics uh, or it's a uh, different types of uh, land, all types of different reasons and excuses that they fight. And it really seems like everyone is literally looking for an excuse to press the, you know, the big scary red button. So uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in essence, is scaring the lights out of us uh, in order for us to do tshuva. Shuvu Yisrael ad Hashem Elokecha. The Kadosh Baruch Hu is telling us to come back to him. And uh, unfortunately, since we didn't listen to it because it's a verse from the Torah, so Kadosh Baruch Hu, in essence, uh, changes certain things in nature, that comfort zone that we're all in, in order to wake us up. Uh, and um, one of the amazing things that Kadosh Baruch Hu did in, in recent generation is that he invented the Internet. He created the Internet. And uh, because even though the Internet is uh, one of the uh, founding places for all the tum'ah of the world, all of the filth in the world, 
you can find on the internet. Within 30 seconds, you can lose your Olam Abba going on the internet. 30 seconds, not even. Today, with high speed, half a second. Half a second, a person loses their Olam Abba. Goes to Gainom for eternity. Half a second. 70 years they can work on getting Olam Abba. Five, half a second, they can lose it. Shem Yerachem. But, Zeket Neged Zebara Elohim. HaKadosh Baruch created everything with a compliment. Good and bad, black and white, tall, short. Tumah of the internet, Kedusha of the internet. You can go to Bezat Hashem.org. But one of the beautiful things is that uh, since there are different people with different tastes in different corners of the world, there are diff- different medias that people like to be reached through. Some people still use the old-fashioned uh, uh, email. Some people, you could only talk to them through WhatsApp. Some people on YouTube. Some people on Facebook. And some people like you to reach out to them through podcasts. So uh, we have a uh, Be'ezrat Hashem podcast. You go to uh, Be'ezrat Hashem uh, dot jewishpodcast.org and you could download, uh, you could uh, go subscribe to one of our podcasts either on, um, on Apple or on Google or all these diff- different types of uh, uh, things that have a podcast where the, the benefit of this is that once a week, you have a uh, shiur from our Musar Pliqe Avot series downloaded automatically to your phone, and you have pretty much your limud. Each shiur is usually around three hours in that series. Most people can't sit there for three hours straight, so most people will listen to that one shiur for the whole week, which is more than fine. Uh, but one thing I always recommend to you guys is never ever turn the shiurim into background music. You know, you should study these shiurim. There's a lot of work that went into these shiurim. a lot of sources in these shiurim. And uh, there's a lot of learning that you can do from the Shulim to, uh, to affect your life. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, go to uh, Ju- uh, Bezot Hashem dot Jewishpodcast dot org or you could just go to our website Bezot Hashem dot org and you can subscribe to our uh, podcast. Also, anyone that wants to get daily updates and short clips, you could send a text message to 1917-468-2324. And subscribe to our WhatsApp um, uh, group. Each day we send about a handful of uh, posts, clips, updates, shiur information. Every day, uh, you know, there's at least a handful of people ask me, where's the shiur? So you can get that without asking me. Uh, not that I don't like your text messages, but you, there's easier, more convenient ways to find out where the shiur is. Uh, also, people ask where to donate. People ask... All types of interesting questions. A lot of the stuff is actually already available to you. Uh, you could save yourself a lot of time. Uh, so, with that being said, we have obviously our Shelot uh, Vetshuvot. You guys uh, hopefully have some questions. I have Baruch Hashem. A lot of interesting information to tell you if you do not have questions. Um, but uh, I could start it with a little bit of a story that uh, maybe will wake us up a little bit, give us a little bit of an understanding of how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us, but at the same token, how unlimited, how unlimited HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. You see, most people today, most people struggle with emuna. Whether you're religious or not, most people struggle with emuna. They have a hard time believing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu really cares about every little thing that you're doing. Whether you're religious or not, I've met religious people and non-religious people that have a hard time believing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu cares whether you wash your hands in the morning, whether you're going to go to Beknesset or not, whether you're going to pray on time or not, whether you're going to keep Shabbat or not. A lot of people think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu simply is too busy. You should know, thinking that is a Greek belief. That's what the Greeks, over 2,000 years ago, told Am Yisrael, yeah, we believe that there's a creator of the world, because obviously this big something we live in had to have come from somewhere. So we believe in a Kadosh Baruch Hu, but we believe he's so big and so powerful, he left. He's too busy to care whether you're going to wash your hands or not, whether you'll find a zivug or not, whether your paycheck is going to clear or not, whether the stock will go up or down. He's too busy for that stuff. He left. That's a Greek belief. That's why we celebrate Hanukkah next week which we'll discuss, you know, certain halachot about it next week, when it's more uh, 
uh, pertaining to the times. But uh, nonetheless, that's what the Greeks wanted us to believe. Many Jews today have the beliefs of the Greeks without even knowing it. There was a study done about two and a half years ago uh, by a Jewish organization about the modern Orthodox community. And uh, guys, if you're going to play on the phone the whole time, it's better off we just go home. Because you can play at home. Because you're bothering me and also you're bothering other people with the phone. Have a little bit of decency. You don't like it, you can go. I'm paying you. You guys are what, 16, 17, 18 years old? I'm paying you $15 to listen to me. The least you can have is actual decency to listen. If you don't want it, you can go home. Because I see the other guys are looking at you. They also want to play on their phone. You're like becoming a Yetzirah for the rest. Now, the, uh, the people 2,000 years ago also had Yetzirah, just like us. Unfortunately, they fell for it. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu destroyed the Bet HaMikdash because of them. Every day, the Bet HaMikdash is not built. That means the word <laughs> that if it was, we would be destroying it. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu is not telling us, no, no, you don't have the merit to build the Bet HaMikdash right now. Opposite. If it was built right now, Hashem would be destroying it. Because of all the shtuyot that's in our mind. And this study that came out two years ago, confirmed it. What did it confirm? One of the findings that they found on the modern Orthodox community, a study of about 4,000 or so different people, which is a relatively decent size study for that uh, size of a community, that over 50%, over 50% of the modern Orthodox Jews, which again, if you ask a modern Orthodox Jew, are you religious? He's going to absolutely tell you yes. No modern Orthodox Jew will ever tell you, I'm not religious, I'm secular. The point of being modern Orthodox is that you believe that you are religious, but you're more modern with the times. It's like, you know, stylish religious. And people think this is perfectly fine. Torah doesn't, but people think, okay, no problem. So what does modern Orthodox do? What do they get us to today? Over 50% of modern Orthodox people, males and females, admitted that they do not believe in Ashgaha Pratit. They do not believe in divine providence. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu is monitoring every single thing that you do, including playing with your phone, including not paying attention, including thinking about the girl you're not even allowed to look at, including whether you're, you believe that Hashem is going to give you Panasa or not. Everything, all the things that are in your mind. This is one of the Karim of being a Jew. It's one of the foundations of being a Jew is that Hashem is so great, He knows in real time, not like uh, slow yesterday's email, real time, 5G, 900G. He knows exactly what every single one of us is thinking right now, what we thought a minute ago, and every single thing is being watched, every single thing is being written down, every single thing is being heard, and every single thing is going to be shown to us one day on Judgment Day. This is one of the foundations of our belief in Judaism. Over 50% of the so-called religious modern Orthodox say, this I don't believe. Now, if you know who this person is that says, I don't believe it, you have somebody, your friend, your brother, your father, your mother, you yourself, don't believe this, you cannot be counted in minyan. Need 10 people for, to pray together. 10 people say Kaddish. 10 people to have any major Jewish ceremony. person doesn't believe Ashgaha Pratit is considered completely an apikos. Now if this was only, let's say, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10%, it would be a tragedy. 10% of Am Yisrael believes, does not believe in Ashgaha Pratit, it's a tragedy. 50%? Hashem Yirachem. It's an epidemic. To say it's a tragedy, it's like saying uh, the Holocaust was a tragedy. Any Holocaust survivor would tell you, calling the Holocaust a tragedy is the understatement of the year. Six million Jews dying and getting slaughtered in cold blood. Calling that a tragedy is an understatement. 
How do you know it's an understatement? Take some time. Go pick up one of the Sfarim. Or you go on my YouTube channel. You go on uh, your playlist called Holocaust Research. On there, there's a list of different lectures that we did about the topic, including an actual movie. A movie that was made. Shows you what happened during the Holocaust. After you watch the movie, and you wipe your tears and probably clean up the vomit, you're going to realize why it wasn't a tragedy at all. It's not tragic at all. Trage- there is no word to describe what happened in the Holocaust. Tragedy is an understatement. It's sad and even more tragic that this generation, most kids have no connection whatsoever to what happened in the Holocaust. Most Jewish kids today have no connection whatsoever. What, what do I care about the Holocaust? What? Tati. He survived. Okay, so he has some tattoo. I got a tattoo also. He got his for free. What? They have no, no understanding of what happened in the Holocaust. That means that we don't have to be concerned about the fact that the generation today is not connected to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Moshe, and Aaron from 3,000 years ago. We are so far removed from our reality, from our heritage, that we cannot even connect to a generation and a half ago. Why? One of the reasons is that we are the most ignorant generation that ever lived. We are simply a generation of people that are unlearned. Most of the information that people learn is on the internet and advertisements. That's how we learn. You tell somebody, listen, read this book. They can tell you, you have a video? Okay, I have a video. Oh, it's an hour and a half. You have something shorter? You have something shorter than an hour and a half? How long do you want it? Three minutes, three and a half. You know, like uh, Prague University. You know, like one of those videos. You have that? Give me the whole uh, world history in three and a half minutes. Can you give me? That means that it's impossible to teach such a generation. All of the people that are making these one-minute Torah videos, three-minute Torah videos, and even ourselves that are making clips of these shurim, five, ten-minute clips, these shurim... It's not supposed to be your limud. It's not supposed to be your daily studies, five, ten minutes. That's supposed to be the appetizer. That five, ten minute clip is supposed to entice you to want to watch the rest of the shiur. It's not supposed to be your entire learning. If all you're learning every day is five, ten minute clips, you're never going to get far away. You're never going to get far, period. You're simply going to stay not very different than how you started. I tell you this hard information because Rabotai Karim, the Holocaust is about to happen again. Gogu Magog is written in the prophets over 3,000 years ago. It's a promise. It's not an uh, assumption. It's not an estimate. It's a promise from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And anyone that has not done tshuva will regret the day they were born. Now, I highly recommend that people take things seriously. Now, does that mean that you have to become a rabbi? No. Does that mean that you have to study from day till night? No. But it means you need to take Judaism seriously. First step, learn what the truth is. Second, do it. Enough with the excuses. Because what's happening, Rabotai, is that people that have all of these suffic, these doubts about Judaism, it's simply because they've never arrived at the emit. They've never arrived at the emit. They want to live the lie in this world, and they've never arrived at the emit. Now, David Melech. In Tehilim number 84, verse 11, is a verse. It says, For one day in your courtyards is better than a thousand elsewhere. Now, most people, myself included, understood this Tehilim, this verse, a very famous verse. As David Melech 
saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, one day in a Bet Midrash is better than a thousand days going and playing basketball, going and playing video games, going on Wall Street making a million dollars a day. One day, Bet Midrash learning the Emet is worth more than a, a thousand days making a million dollars a day. That's the pshat, that's the basic understanding that everybody had. It's David Melech talking to Hashem. Saying to Hashem, I love you so much, I love the emet so much, that even one day of having it, Shtabach Shimo is the greatest thing in the world. But the Gemara Masechet Makot, page 10a, says the opposite. It says it's actually David being talked to by Hashem. David said to Hashem, Hashem, when am I going to die? When am I going to die, Hashem? Hashem says, I can't tell you. He says, what day, what day of the week? It's going to be Shabbat. You're going to die on Shabbat, David. We spoke about this last week. So David says to Hashem, David says to Hashem, okay, so let me uh, die on uh, Friday. Let me die on Friday. So at least I don't die on Shabbat, so they can bury me on Friday. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to David, I'm very upset at Am Yisrael. I'm very upset at Am Yisrael. Why am I upset? All of Am Yisrael, all of the people, under David HaMelech, are looking forward for David to die. Why? Because they already know the prophecy is, as soon as David HaMelech dies, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give the kingdom to his son Shlomo, and Shlomo is going to build the Beit HaMikdash. Beit HaMikdash, it's like having a Kadosh Baruch Hu on uh, better than WhatsApp, being friends with Hashem on Facebook. Shtabach Shimo, you go to Beit HaMikdash, talk to Hashem. You see a, a, a fire, a fire coming from heaven every single day in the shape of a lion to burn the Korbanot. Imagine, the cloud, this, but it's fire, blue fire, coming down from heaven every day. Lion. Who's not going to believe in miracles? Who's not going to believe in Ashgacha Pratit? You're seeing stuff happen. It's not like stories anymore. So all of Ami says, looking forward to this, they want to build the Beit HaMikdash. So the Vida Melch says to Hashem, let me die earlier, so that way everybody wins. One, I don't die on Shabbat, so because you can't bury a person on Shabbat. I die on Friday. And two, Am Yisrael is happy. Why? I die a little earlier. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to David, one day of your learning Torah is worth to me more than a thousand korbanot. A thousand sacrifices that your son and the rest of Am Yisrael will make in the Beit HaMikdash. Why is this a big deal to us, Rabotai? Anybody here David the Melech? No. Anybody here related to David? Not so sure. Rabotai. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told David, you learning Torah is worth to me more than the Beit HaMikdash itself. More than the Karbonot, more than everything. Why is this important? That means that you sitting here right now, listening to Torah, is worth to HaKadosh Baruch Hu more than all of the sacrifices of the Beit HaMikdash. You opening a Gemara, learning, sweating a little bit, trying to figure out what does it actually mean? Who's against who? Why are they arguing? Why can't they all be friends? Why is there machloket? Why do I care about this specific issue if it already happened 3,000 years ago? And so on and so forth. You toiling to get to the emet, to get to the bottom line of the truth is worth to HaKadosh Baruch Hu more than korbanot, more than sacrifices at the Bet HaMikdash. That's how much it's worth. So, with that being said, this is how we know how valuable the emet is to Hashem. How valuable it is for Hashem for you to know it before it's too late. Because the Gemara in Masechet Avodah Zarah says, once Mashiach comes, there's no more nothing. There's no more conversions, there's no more tshuva, 
There's no more, oh, I'm sorry. Once Mashiach comes, we're finished. The reality is, the reality is, it's finished really before that. Why? Why is it finished before that? Because Gog and Magog is going to happen before the Mashiach comes. Gog and Magog is not going to be a peaceful war. You know, one side shoots, the other one waits, gets hit. Okay, you know what? We'll wait two weeks, then we'll hit you back. Gog and Magog is going to be a very, very scary war, making everything else that happened before it seem like child's play. And that means we're not going to have the opportunities we have today to study Torah whenever we feel like it. Go, wake up, look at your phone. Instead of seeing all the junk, you go on BeZotHashem.org, you go to our YouTube channel, you go to our app, you go to the podcast, you press play, and you sit there while you're drinking your coffee. A few times a week, you roll out of bed, you have a shiur 20 minutes away. Five minutes away. For free. We're not going to have those opportunities. Meaning that to do tshuva during the war is not going to be a piece of cake. Go to Minyan, go pray. You have five, six, seven, ten choices in many Jewish communities. You can pray whenever you feel like it sometimes. You need to feel in. All you got to do Make a phone call, send a text message, send a few dollars, you got tefillin within a few days. You want a book, you go on the internet, tu, 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 within two days, you got the book. Whatever book you want, whatever sefer you want. Not going to be that easy. It's not going to be that easy. Meaning that to do tshuva once the war is out, it's pretty much the end of times. It's pretty much the end of doing tshuva. Because to do tshuva takes time. You need to know stuff. You need to know what you don't know today. You need to know halachot Shabbat. How do you keep Shabbat? Better yet, how do you not violate Shabbat? Most people think that keeping Shabbat is sleeping, eating, going to shul if you feel like it, and hanging out with the guys. That's what most people think keeping Shabbat is. That means that all of the, all of the, the, the cows... Right off of I-95, the Osho Shabbat then. They do it every day. They eat, they drink. They don't go to Beknesset usually though. So whenever they go, they come and stake. So what, they're all going to go to Gan Eden? Shabbat is not just about eating, drinking, going to Beknesset and sleeping. It's, it's more than that. You need to know that. You need to know how to keep the holidays. Not just the fast. Fasting on Yom Kippur is not really the Ikal. Most people think they fast on Yom Kippur. Oh, yeah, I keep Yom Kippur. vast majority of people do not keep Yom Kippur without even knowing it. Why? The Mishnah says, Someone who says, I'm going to sin, then do tshuva, sin, do do tshuva. HaKadosh Baruch is not going to let him do tshuva, and even Yom Kippur is not going to help him. So Chamim say, what does this mean? Yom Kippur, Rabotai, the Gemara Masechet Ta'anit, page 25a, says, the whole point of Yom Kippur is for you to do tshuva, not for you to fast. If you fasted on Yom Kippur, but you didn't do tshuva, you didn't commit to stop sinning, all you did is diet. In Shemaim, they don't even count that you kept Yom Kippur. It's meaningless. Shem doesn't care if you eat. The Hashem cares if you eat. If he didn't want you to eat, you just put starvation. Famine. Everybody's religious. So, the point is, Rabotai, these are the types of things you're going to need to know because that's the emit. That's the emit. If you didn't know it until now, Baruch Abba. Welcome. This is Judaism. Uh, does that mean it's really hard? Not necessarily. Judaism is not hard. It's only hard for people who don't want to do it. If you don't want to change your life, Judaism is extremely hard. But if you want to change your life, you want to be a better person, you want to be closer to Hashem, then Judaism is very easy. Now, what's the benefit of wanting to get close to Hashem? I'll give you this story and then you can ask as many questions as you want. 
הרב גלינסקי, עליו השלום, overcame some of the tests that none of us could pass. But during his day, the communist Russians, the Soviets, they hated religion to the extent where if you practice religion openly, they'd kill you. Not like today, Baruch Hashem, you're in America, you're in the UK, you're in a, uh, Canada, you're in Israel. You practice religion, maybe a few people will annoy you, but no one's going to kill you. Maybe they'll make fun of you. Maybe they'll do all types of things to make your life more difficult, but you're not going to get killed for being a Jew. Baruch Hashem. In those days, which we're not talking about that long ago, talking about your grandparents' age, 40, 50 years ago, if you were religious, in certain parts, certain people saw you, and simply kill you on the spot. Now, communists don't believe in capitalism, meaning you cannot make your own money. Everybody shares. The government controls all money. So the way they force people to abandon Judaism is by simply saying, if you practice Judaism, you're not going to get the food stamps. If you don't get the food stamps, you can't eat. Because no one accepts money. Can't go to the store and say, hey, here's $150, give me some steak. No, no, Habibi. Only way, only form of payment is the food stamps from the government. Now, during this time, Rav Galinsky decided to open a yeshiva. Where? In Soviet. In this, and exactly the place where they're going to kill you for being religious. Why? He says, there's no Torah, all the schools closed, i got to open something. Why? Talmud Torah can negate kunam. Learning Torah is more valuable than anything else. Yeah, but they're going to they're gonna kill you. Who said? Now, no one wanted to come to his yeshiva. Why? He said, listen, if we send our kids to your yeshiva, the Soviets are simply going to take our food stamps away. We're going to starve to death. Rav Galinsky says, don't worry. I'll get you food. I'll get you the food stamps. How are you going to get the food stamps for all these kids, all these kids' families? He says, don't worry, Kadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. Such emunah, that to have that emunah on yourself takes work, but it's not uh, the same level of emunah as taking that where you're taking charge of other people's lives. Now, you know yourself, worst case scenario, you could go and maybe eat all, at your friend's house if you're by yourself. Fast for a couple of days. Go, uh, do figure, you'll figure out by yourself, but to feed 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 families, where are you going to get that food? You can't joke around with this. Not, it cannot be fake emuna. Whoever signed up, Rav Galinsky got them the food stamps. How? He went to the black, to the uh, gray market, found somebody, says, listen, his food stamps, his money, do, 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 exchange for a uh, bartering system. He got everybody the food stamps. The problem with this is that this is illegal. It's a violation of the law in Soviet Russia. And before you know it, they caught Rav Galinsky. They put him in jail. They said, concluded, trial concluded. What's the, what's the conclusion of the trial? Death penalty. For what? For violating the law. For thinking you can learn Torah when we said no. Death penalty. Now in this cell with everybody else, it's like central bookings. You know, the police police have, I uh, hope Bezal Hashem, none of you ever know, but there's two places. There's central bookings, which is pretty much after a person gets arrested and you're in a cell with a bunch of degenerates, low lives, drug dealers, all types of filthy, disgusting people. And everybody's in one cell, like a zoo, where the lion and the zebra are in the same cell. Like, it doesn't matter what your crime was. You stole uh, candy. You're in the same place as somebody that just chopped somebody else's head off. Same cell. A lot of times in those cells, people get, go, get sent to the hospital. But not because of their crime, but because of the punishment, how the system is. But then after that, after the trial is completed, they send it as the person, Hashem Yachem, then there's the actual prison, where you are in a cell, usually with one or two other inmates. Not with 40, 50 people. 
Here, in Russia, there were so many people getting sentenced to death, every cell was like central bookings. 40, 50, 100 people in one little cell. Since everybody got the death penalty, people were losing their mind. Rav Galinsky said the story himself. He says people were losing their mind inside their cell because everybody knew that tomorrow, each person is going to die. He said in the cell, there was also a priest. They got arrested at the same time as Rav Galinsky. Now the Russians, these people are very sick in those days. They, the Soviets, they figured since we're going to kill everybody, let's uh, feed them. So they would bring a bunch of food into the cell, like a last supper. So they brought some food. Rav Galinsky looked at what's allowed, what's not allowed. Saw that the bread is allowed. Saw that there's jam, jelly. That's allowed. Did natila and start eating. The priest in there looks at him. He's the only guy eating. Everybody else is losing their mind. They're all crying. They're all hysterical, yelling, going crazy, beating each other up. And you see this little guy. He was mamas, this little. Tiny, tiny little rabbi. You see him. He has videos on him on the internet. You see him. When he spoke to people, he was like a lion. But he spoke, he stands on top of the table. You see this lion, complete, but a little guy. Huge neshama. He's eating comfortably in the cell. Everybody's losing their mind, killing each other. The priest goes to Rav Galinsky, he goes, how could you eat? Tomorrow they're going to kill you. Rav Galinsky says, who said? He goes, what do you mean, who said? The, the judge said. He says, who's the judge? Judge flesh and blood. Till tomorrow? There's plenty of time for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Let me eat. Leave me alone. Till tomorrow, who said they're going to kill me? What, because of a, a flesh and blood, the son of going to die? Who, who even considers him? For what? The Shem is going to kill me for learning Torah? For teaching his, his children Torah? He's going to kill me? Who said? As you would have it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he sees his children sacrificing their life for Torah, he simply changes nature for them. The head attorney in charge of sentencing in Soviet Russia got sick to the point where the doctor said, you're going to die. It's only a matter of days. She said, listen, I'm a very important person. Is there a cure? So yes, there is a cure, but we don't have it. Maybe you can get it in the black market. Her husband, she's bedridden. She cannot move. She's dying, mamash, piece by piece. Her husband goes to the black market, finds the medicine. The guy says, okay, yeah, what do you want? Okay, I want this medicine for my wife. Okay, no problem. It's a uh, $100,000. What? I, who can get you that kind of money? I don't have that kind of money. But okay, so let her die. I don't care. This is how I would make a living. <laughs> I care about your wife. I care about money. This guy has no idea what to do. HaKadosh Baruch Hu put a rich Jewish person in the right place at the right time and says to the guy, how much you need? $100,000? I come up with $100,000 for you if you want. Okay, help me. You can help me? Oh, it's a condition. Business. There's a Someone, it's important to me, inside your jail cell, it's about to get the death penalty. Since your wife is the head attorney in charge of death penalties, I want your wife to sign off on freeing someone by the name of Rav Yaakov Galinsky. He says, no problem. Okay, deal. Guys, gets him the medicine, brings it to the wife, she's cured. All of a sudden, her color comes back. She's starting to ah, breathe. Everything is good. A few days pass. A week passes. Rav is not, he's not freed. They meet. What's going on? No, no, no. Listen, my wife said it's, um, it's not going to happen. What do you mean it's not going to happen? I, I paid the medicine. She said, no, I, I can't do it. I'm only an attorney. It's, uh, that's not exactly what was the deal. What do you mean? You want me to free him? Why would you want me to free a criminal? Maybe you're a criminal. 
You want me to free criminals? She didn't want to free him. She reneged on the deal. Why? Because she's healthy now. Just like it says in the parasha, two weeks from now, what does it say? It says that after, after Yaakov, in the beginning of Exodus, three weeks from now, beginning of Exodus, there's a new paro that forgot who Yosef was. Chazal says, what do you mean if paro forgot who Yosef was? No, no, it's the same exact paro. He didn't want to remember Yosef. Why? Because it didn't fit his interest anymore. It didn't fit his interest. Anyway, Rabotai Karim, it didn't fit our interest. When she needed the money, she needed the medicine, she'll say yes to anything. When we need something, we say yes to anything Hashem says. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu puts us in situations where we need Him. You have problems? That's because Akadosh Baruch Hu needs your attention. But Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't like when people play with uh, his children's lives. She didn't want to free Rav Galinsky, she got sick again. A week later, she got sick. Dying again. He's back in the black market. The Jew is over there. He says, this time, I want it in writing ahead of time. I want Rav Galinsky freed, then I'll pay for the medicine. Suddenly she has the power. Suddenly she is the right attorney. Suddenly she can do it. And she does. Now, throughout all of that time, do you think Rav Galinsky thought for a second he's going to die? Not even for one second. Why? Because he was already glued to Hashem for many, many years before that. He was prepared for this day. Rabotai Yekarim, these shiurim are to prepare you for any type of difficulty you may have in the future. Whether it's marriage, or it's a health issues, or it's the Mashiach, or it's whatever it is. That's the point of these shiurim, to get you glued to Hashem, so when the time comes and you need Him, you're not going to lose hope for a second. You're not going to forget about Ashgacha Pratit. Because you're going to have it the whole way there. So with that being said, Bechabod, who wants to start with the first question? Bechabod, give to Jacob over here. Is this on? Uh, Sunny, it's on? Yeah, it's on. No, I don't know. Um, so my question is, if we learn that uh, then when the Mashiach comes, that all the holidays are going to be like canceled out, except for Purim and Hanukkah, does that mean that the Torah changes? Because the Torah's part of keeping the mitzvot is to keep the holidays. If we learn, repeat, I'm sorry. The, 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 if we learn if, that the only thing we're going to keep is is uh, Hanukkah and, uh, and Purim. Purim. Yeah. Then is the Torah changing? Yeah, does that does that mean that the Torah changes? Because if we no longer have to keep, let's say, if we no longer have to fast on Yom Kippur, or if we no longer have to do anything, what, what does that? No, it doesn't mean that the Torah changes. Chas <coughs> Shalom. It means that it's the there are certain things that you everything we do we do for a reason. For example, Yom Kippur. What's the point of Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur. The point of it is to do tshuva. So after Mashiach comes, there's no more tshuva. So what's the point of Yom Kippur? Meaning, it's not that the Torah change, it's that there's no use for that mitzvah anymore because there's no more tshuva. You could fast until you were blue in the face. It won't help you at that point. Why? If you've survived Mashiach, you don't need to do tshuva anymore. You're finished. If you, uh, if you haven't done tshuva, you won't survive Mashiach anyway. So your Yom Kippur is already long gone. Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, what's the point of it? It's Judgment Day. Day Mashiach shows up, that's already Judgment Day. Meaning, after Mashiach, there's no more Judgment Day. So, there's no point for that either. Uh, Pesach. To remember, Yitziat Mitzrayim. But the Prophet Jeremiah says, what's going to happen at the time of, uh, of Mashiach, when the land of the north will attack, and the, uh, the, there's going to be a big war, and so on and so forth, but then the Mashiach Tzidkenu is going to come, and bring us salvation, beat all of the enemies, some of them being Jewish enemies, some of them being non-Jewish enemies, and so on and so forth. The miracles that will happen during this time will be much, much greater. That's what the Prophet says. Much greater than what happened in Mitzrayim 
to the extent that he's no longer, that Hashem will no longer be remembered as the God that freed us from Egypt, but rather the God that freed us from the land of the north, rather the God that brought us salvation. Meaning these new miracles are going to be so magnificent that it's going to be super supersede anything before it. Why remember, why have Pesach, for example, to remember something smaller when we just experience something bigger, especially the current generation? Uh, you know, so and so on and so forth. The rest of the holidays, every one of them have a specific purpose, but that purpose would have lived out its day. It would have achieved uh, its point, and therefore, there's no point of continuing it. Uh, it's a uh, so that's 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 the thing. It's not that the Torah changes. It's simply that it's no longer something that we need to do anymore. You know, just like for example, if somebody is hungry, somebody is hungry. What does he do? He looks for food. He opens the fridge looks at the phone, he decides whether he's going to order something or cook something. But after he eats, he's not looking for food anymore. Why? He satiated himself. He satisfied himself. He doesn't, he's not looking for food anymore. So that's in essence the same point. Torah doesn't change. It's just that these, these certain mitzvot would have reached their purpose. And after that, the only things that will continue having a purpose is the rabbinical ones, which is uh, Purim and Hanukkah. Next question. How about to... Joshua here. In the back, you're also allowed to ask questions. You're allowed. Permission today. If, uh, if a person uh, loses his olam haba, <coughs> is it gone forever? Or can he get everything that uh, he she worked for back? If he loses his olam haba, can he get it back? Yeah. Did he die yet or no? No. Oh, yeah. So as long as a person is alive... As long as a person is alive, he could do tshuva. Now, the Rambam, Ilchot Tshuva, talks about details of who loses their Olam Abba. There are different people that lose their Olam Abba. There are 36 sins, and the Zohar adds another 12. 36 sins that a person can do in order to lose their Olam Abba. For example, a person that's with a Nida, a Jewish male that is with a woman that's not his wife. If she's not his wife, that means she did not go to the mikveh. So let's say, for example, he's 17, 18 years old, or he's 77 years old. doesn't make a difference. And he wants to be with another Jewish person, a Jewish woman, but she doesn't go to the mikveh. That means that she's nida. The second he touches her, the second that they're intimate, they both lost olam haba. Another example, a Jewish guy, he's 15, 25, 35, 45, he saw something on TV, he saw something on a billboard, he saw something on the internet that got him aroused, he decided to waste seed, he acted on it, he wasted seed, he lost Olam Abba. A woman decides that she doesn't feel like keeping Shabbat this week. She wants to go on the internet to check out what's going, what our girlfriends are doing on vacation because they all went out for the weekend and she didn't go. She wants to see what they're doing. Maybe, maybe they're making some Facebook posts. She goes, she turns on the computer, she lost Olam Abba. She turns, she goes into a car to drive somewhere, she lost Olam Abba. And so on and so forth. When a person makes a sin that's Isur Karet, they lose their share of the world to come. Now, what does it mean they lose the share of the world to come? That means that if they died right that second, if Hashem judged them with pure judgment, with emet, at that second, and they died, they would enter Genom and never leave. They would go into a place of suffering that makes the Holocaust look like child's play, and they would simply never ever leave. Eternal Gainum. Now, some people are going to say to you, you know, these uh, puppies, they call themselves rabbis, say, no, what do you mean eternal? How could there be eternal judgment? How could there be eternal bad? What do you mean, how could there be? It says it in the Gemara. It says it in the Chumash. It says it in the Zohar. It says it all, all over the place. That's what it means. You have no share of the world to come. That's what it means. It means permanent punishment until the soul is completely destroyed. 
and the only thing that's left is this is the chelik eloka mima, the the part of God that goes back to the source. That's what losing Allah Abba means. Now, if the person is smart and lucky at the same time, smart that when they see the emet, they grab onto it, and lucky, lucky enough to live in a generation where Kadosh Baruch Hu has extra mercy to show every single person the emet multiple times. They take advantage of it and they do tshuva. They say, Hashem, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to violate Shabbat. Hashem, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to walk around immodest. Hashem, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to worship an idol called Yoshke or Buddha or money or whatever idol people have. Hashem, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to waste seed. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go against you. I'm never going to do it again. They try their best to never ever do it again. They make certain fences, certain things to protect themselves. They know that every time they go to a certain place, they get... They make sins. They don't go there anymore. They know every time they hang out with certain people, they make sins. They don't hang out with those people no more. They know that there are certain things that trigger them to make sins. So they show Hashem that they're serious, not just by words, by actions. And then they also give some tzedakah to make sure that their money is where their mouth is. They do tikkunim. And last but not least, they help other people. Do tshuva, Akadosh Baruch Hu erases their sins. <coughs> even though that sin was technically supposed to be an eternal genom, and even if they've made that sin for 30, 40 years, 50 years straight, 50 years straight, every single day they made one of those sins, they could still go to Gan Eden and never enter a foot into genom if their tshuva is real. That's how much mercy Hashem has. I'll give you guys a chidush. Is a very famous midrash on the Song of Songs, Shira Shirim. In a midrash Rabba, uh, in uh, Piska Hey. It's a very famous midrash that uh, Shlomo Amelech brings light to the world, where Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Pitchuli petach kechudo shel machat, v'ani iftach lachem petach ki pitcho shel ulam. Open for me. An opening. Kadosh Baruch is telling Am Yisrael, open for me an opening in your heart, in your actions. The size of the eye of the needle. You know, ever see a needle? The needle has a small little hole in it. Hashem says, only open me a little one like that. And I will open to you a huge hallway, a huge theater, a huge wedding hall. Now this is a very well-known midrash. Many, many people say, listen, no matter how down you are, how many sins you've made, how horrible your condition is, you open a little opening for Hashem. You show Him you believe in Him. You show Him that you have emunah in Him. You show Him that you have bitachon in Him. You show Him that you're serious about His Torah. You're going to do what He says? And you do it. Hashem will open the world for you in a way that you could never imagine. Anyone that would have known me 10 years ago, forget 10 years ago, Seven years ago, six years ago, five years ago, a year ago, and would have told me I would be here today. I would have told you you should write comic books. Why? You have a vivid imagination. I'm going to be a rabbi. I'm going to learn Torah. I'm going to help people all over the world do tshuva. Are you out of your mind? And best of all, for free. <laughs> I make $3,000 an hour. I'm going to do it for free. I wake up in the morning. Just to wake up, I get $3,000. <laughs> what do you get? What are you talking about? I'm going to work for free. Your mother's going to work for free. Why is going to work for free? What are you talking about? That's what I would told you. That was me. To open my eyes, to open my eyes, $30,000. I'm going to work for free. And I'm going to help other people make do tshuva. What do I care about tshuva? I didn't do tshuva. I'm going to help people do tshuva. Keep Shabbat? I don't keep Shabbat. What are you talking about? Go write comic books, kid. I'll even invest in them. You have such a good imagination. Here's $25,000. Good luck, kid. That's what I would have told you. What are you talking about? If you would have told me, hey, you know, one day, you're not going to be in pain 24 hours a day. You're not going to be in hospitals every single week. I'd say, kid, two comic books. One for the Wall Street one, and one for, uh, I don't know, uh, science fiction, something. 
You kid, you, you're the best. You're the best. Here's 50,000. What are you talking about? I'm going to do this? What's wrong with you? Rabotai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu could change the world in a second. In a second. I've seen it with my own eyes, on my own skin, and in many, many other people's eyes. In many, many other people's lives. People that literally, when, they fir- when I first met them, they were crack addicts. Not an expression. Literally. Crack addicts. You know, the worst. Injecting themselves every day. Today, they're living a life you could only admire. You could only admire. Wife, kids, money, everything you want in this world. And that's not even, that they don't even care about it. They, what do they care? They have a Kadosh Baruch Hu. People that came from the, 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 the Tumah of the Tumah, Christianity, worshipped an idol every single day. Today, Tzadikim, Tzadikim, have little Tzadikim kids, little cute kids with payers and everything. They wake up in the morning, instead of saying Yoshke, they say Modeani, Modeani, Takadosh Baruch why I'm alive. Where they come from? The church. What, three, four, five years ago? If you would have told him that five years ago, I said, listen, I'll double what he's investing in you. Comic books. What are you talking about? But that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu does. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you opened for me saw a opening. The eye of a needle, the size of the eye of the needle, I'll open for you a world. What's the Chidush? The Chidush is, Rabotai, if you look at it, the word Ulam, which is like a hall, is spelled with a Aleph. Olam, world, spelled with a Ayn. Now, Ulam doesn't only mean like a wedding hall or, 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 or something like that. Ulam was also the section inside the Bet Mikdash, right outside the Kodesh Kodeshim. That was also a section of the Bet Mikdash called Ulam. Right outside the Kodesh, which is right next to the Kodesh Kodeshim. So what is Hashem giving us here? He's saying, you open for me. A little prayer. You pray Mincha with Kavana. You pray Arvit with Kavana. You pray Shachrit with Kavana. You read a few Tehilim for Am Yisrael because you care about them. You go to a shiur even if you're tired. A little opening. Hashem says, I'm going to treat it as if you've arrived to the Bet HaMikdash, the third one, not the first or the second, the third one. You have arrived to it, and you and I are meeting eye to eye. You and I are talking. Whatever you want. Show me you're serious. That's how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do tshuva. Which means, if you do tshuva, you're not only the smartest person in the world, you're the luckiest. You don't do tshuva, you're the dumbest and unluckiest person in the world. There's only two options. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I'll give you the whole world on a silver platter for things that don't cost much, don't require much, just a little effort. Small little eye of a needle. You don't take advantage of it, you deserve the punishment. And that's why Chachamim say in the Rishit Chokhmah, in Shamaim, after Hashem shows the Rasha everything that he did and what he could have had, the Rasha tells Hashem, Hashem, please put me in Genom. The Rasha asks for it. Why? He's so embarrassed. He's so embarrassed at how stupid he is for not doing tshuva. So the answer is. No matter what you did, you can still do tshuva as long as you're alive. But the second a person is no longer alive, there's no tshuva in Shemaim. There's no more tshuva. But here you could do tshuva, no matter what you did. Wasted seed, even if you worship an idol. Even if you worship idols, mamas, which is like the worst thing you could do. You, instead of worshiping Hashem, you worship this cup. You replaced Kodesh Kodeshim, Melech Malcheam Lachim, Akadosh Baruch Hu, with a cup. Styrofoam. Akadosh Baruch Hu says, You did tshuva, I'll accept it. That's how much He loves you while you're in this world, though. You finished? Finished. Finished.
finished. That's why, Rabotai, every single Jew needs to mamash. Beg Hashem, beg Hashem to accept this tshuva. Cry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu every single day for accepting this tshuva. Cry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu every single day for allowing him to do tshuva. Allowing her to do tshuva. To put on kisui rosh every single day and every second you're alive is a mitzvah. Put on a tzitzit and every single minute that you're alive is a mitzvah. Read a little Torah, listen to some real Torah on the internet or live. And every single second you're here, you're doing a mitzvah. For that, there's no end to the gratitude we owe to Kadosh Baruch Hu. To be honest with you, Rabbi Tai, it's the only reason I'm here. As much as I like all of you, I'm only here for him. Because he likes you. Bemet, I could do this at home. I could do a video at home. I go in, my, in front of my computer, camera, and I can reach just as many people on the internet just by simply being at home in my pajamas. But since he loves each and every single one of you, much more than I could ever love you, much more than I could even love my own kids, I come. Why? Because he loves you. And you're his kids. And I love him. And therefore I have to love you also. That's why I tell you, if you're already in a shiul, pay attention. It's for you. It's for you, the whole shiul. It's not for me. For me, I, I can do it at home. It's for you. This is a Kadosh Baruch Hu designed the world in a certain way to send somebody to Genom and back for years in order to arrive here today and give you a shiul. He's custom made the world just for you to have a shiul today. That shows that Hashem loves you. Next question. Sutton, if you give him the mic, please. Do angels have free will? Do angels have free will? I think it's the second time I heard this question today. Uh, somebody said they're confused over this. So, free will is not something that we truly can understand can understand in our limited capacity, but we can understand to a certain extent. So, humans, it says, excuse me, akol midei shamayim chutz mirat shamayim. Everything is from heaven except the fear of heaven, meaning a human being does not have the ability to choose if he's going to be born or if he's going to die. Even if he shoots himself in the head, only Hashem decides if he's going to die or not. Even if he jumps off of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, only Hashem decides if he's going to die or not. Now, even though statistics show that the overwhelming majority of people, 99.9% .9 of people that jump out of the bridge are going to die, there's a guy that has a video on the internet, young guy, probably in his 30s, maybe even 20s, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge to commit suicide. No parachute, no bungee cord. You want to die. And he's on a video telling about it, that he didn't die. Why? Hashem decided he's not going to die. Meaning that your life or death, you cannot choose. Whether you're going to be rich or poor, you cannot choose. Yeah, but I have a certain amount of job. I'm making a certain amount of money. So what? I know plenty of guys that worked in the money business, Wall Street, where every moron could be rich. You don't have to be a genius. People think that Wall Street guys are geniuses. Average Wall Street guy is a moron, complete moron, donkey. But he knows how to do certain things. He has a certain talent, like an autistic savant. He could sell, he could do calculations, he could communicate a certain way, analyze. There's a certain talent he has that allows him to make a certain amount of money. It does not mean that every Wall Street guy is a genius, even if he makes 10, 20 million dollars a year. Same thing with doctors. People think that all doctors are geniuses. No, they have a certain talent, certain ability that they're very good at. But they can be retarded and all the other things. Point being is, sometimes you'll see two doctors. And you're going to say, yo, this young doctor is much better than the old man. Why? Because you don't know what you're talking about. You think that the young doctor is better than the old doctor because the young doctor was nicer to you. So you think that makes him a better doctor. Little do you know that the young doctor, he just graduated two years ago. He hasn't even performed two surgeries. 
the old doctor that's, that's, that's angry and grouchy, he's already done 5,000 surgeries. He's the real doctor. But just because the young one has better bedside manner, you think he's a better doctor. That's because you're not a good judge. You have no idea what you're talking about. The point is, Rabotai, is that many times we are not good judges of our own character or other people's characters, our own abilities or other people's abilities. But nonetheless, Hashem decides what those abilities will yield. He'll decide if a Wall Street guy is going to make money or not. I know a bunch of guys that were on Wall Street were literally borrowing money just to survive. You're in the money business. You're investing millions of dollars with people, but didn't have a penny, a penny to, to, to buy coffee with. Nothing. And then I know a bunch of guys that were in different, different businesses, car washes, laundromats, selling stuff on Amazon, uh, driving uh, taxis that became millionaires. I know one guy that works for UPS. UPS truck, you know, he drives a car till this day. Drives the brown car, brown truck. Here, people look, oh, he's a UPS guy. You guys, are... I know some of those guys that work for UPS worth 15, 25 million dollars. He's still driving the car today. He's gonna make millions of dollars every year from UPS. He makes maybe uh, probably 90,000, 100,000 a year. So how did he make so much money? He took the money, invested it, and he made a lot of money. Guy's worth 15, 20 million dollars. He's got pff, maybe 50, 100 properties. So, looks can be deceiving. Looks can be deceiving. Certain people think that if they have a certain amount of job, or they work a certain amount of hours, or they do certain things, they're going to make more money. No, wrong. Only a Kadosh Baruch Hu can decide if you're going to be rich or poor. Only a Kadosh Baruch Hu. So, what's really left for us to choose? The only thing that's left for us to choose is whether we serve Hashem or not. Whether we do what His Holy Torah says or not. That's your free choice. What about angels? Angels do not have the same type of free choice, but they do have a free choice nonetheless, but it's a different type. What's different about it? First of all, they don't have the desires we do. They don't have a desire to work and make money and be proud and show off and, and, and uh, do all types of things like that. But angels do have certain things that they desire. For example, all angels desire to serve Hashem. There's a certain group of angels that are created and destroyed every day. They're created and they're destroyed on the same day. Why? They're created to serve Hashem and say His name, bless His name. Say Kadosh, 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 say the Hashem. But they're destroyed right after that. Why? They said it too fast. It's too early. Who said to say right now? Wait. He's destroyed every day. Millions of them. Certain angels will wait 2,000 years. 2,000 years to say Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. What you can say every single day when you pray in a minyan. For free. They wait 2,000 years to say it. And they wait patiently. That's what they want. Now, if an angel makes a sin, if you will, makes a mistake, if you will, they're punished immediately. He serves Hashem, but not the perfect way. He's punished immediately. A human, on the other hand, there's much more mercy on him. If he's alive in this world, she's alive in this world, she decided that she's only going to wear half an outfit. She calls it a mini skirt. She calls it a skirt that barely covers her legs. She calls it a shirt that's a t-shirt that animals shouldn't even wear. But she walks around with a shirt that pretty much discloses our entire body, leaves nothing to the imagination. So she walks outside, she's making a sin. Why? She's not modest. She's the king's daughter, but she looks like every uh, average farmer or something. How could the king's daughter look like this? The guy, instead of going to put on tefillin in the morning, he goes and uh, plays video games instead. He doesn't feel like praying. It's a sin. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves that daughter, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves that son, even though that son is going against him, even though that daughter is going against him, he doesn't punish him right away. He gives them time. He says, maybe tomorrow. Maybe next week. Maybe next year. And he gives them more time and more opportunities. 
and more difficulties to bring them back, to put them in a situation where they have to call to Hashem. They have to call to Hashem because they realize that all of the junk that they served and did their whole life didn't pay. The only thing that could save them is Hashem. So Hashem loves everybody, but there's a limit to it. What's the limit? Limit is this world. Limit is this world. So the difference between angels and men is that angels will get punished right away. Men do not. Human beings do not. Sometimes they do, but most of the time they do not get punished right away. That's the main difference. Next question. Good question. In the front, please. So, Wait, hold on. With the uh, mic. Thank you. So how do angels sin if they don't have free will? That's my first question. They do have free will, but it's not the same type of free will as us. Meaning, when a Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world, Later on he says, Later on it says, on the sixth day, Hashem says, we'll make man in our image, to our likeness. So, Chachamim say, who is Hashem talking to? There's only one God. Who is he? Who's our likeness? Our likeness and our image. Who's our? Our is plural. Salmenu kedmutenu. These are plural words. So Chamim says he's talking to the angels. He's talking to the angels because the angels were, were created before man. Why is he asking them for guidance? Why does he need advice from them? No, it's that Hashem saw that the angels were his servants, but they were a little bit upset that mankind, that the Am Yisrael eventually is going to be the firstborn son, more important than anybody else in the world. So to make them like a partner... He says, "What we we're going to make men in our image, as if they're a partner to the creation. You are, so don't feel like you're being left out. You're a partner in all of this. Not that he needs their advice. That's also the way of a king is to have servants. But what do we also learn? Parashat Noach. It says that the Nephilim, the Nephilim were giants that were half man, half angel. And the Midrash says, where did this half man, half angel come from? Two angels." When Hashem says, let's make man in our image, two angels did not say yes. In fact, two angels says, no, it's a bad idea. They're going to go against you. They're going to sin in this world. It doesn't make any sense. In essence, what they were saying is, Hashem, you're making a mistake. Which shows us they have an opinion. They're allowed to say yes or no. Hashem says, oh, you think that you're better than them? I'm going to send you to the world. And let's see how you do. And he sent them to the world, and they became the Nephilim. And the Nephilim made sins with humans. Humans in those days were different than they are today. Look different, acted different uh, in so many aspects of it, and also sizes were different. Nephilim were giants, uh, especially in comparison to today. Today were midges next to them. And, uh, but anyway, these Nephilim were very, very big sinners, and uh, as part of the uh, Mabul, is Hashem punished those two angels and sent them to a place called Azazel. Anyone that's, uh, that's Israeli, there's a, uh, there's a uh, term, terminology, slang term. Lech le Azazel, go to Azazel. And most people think it's like go to hell. It actually does mean that, but it's a specific type of hell that's for those couple of angels. Now, so here we see that angels do have a certain amount of free choice, but it's a different free choice than ours. Because we made much bigger crimes than they did, but we're still alive. Which means that Hashem is giving us more chances, more time. But also we have more limitations. So they do have a free choice, but again, it's not, it's not really free choice. Not for us and not for them. Nothing is free. There's a cost. But it is, it is in essence a choice. So why did Hashem create angels in the first place? Because He obviously doesn't need them. Right, I answered that why I said it's the way of a king is to have servants. When does a king become a king? If a king is by himself and he has nobody else, he, he decided he decided to buy, he decided to buy some uh, some piece of some island in Tahiti, and he's by himself. Is he a king? He's not even a butler. Why? He's by himself. What's the way of a king? The way of a king is to have servants. How many servants? 
the more servants, the more soldiers, the more uh, messengers that this king has, the more glorious he is. Hashem has an infinite amount of servants. Some are small little tiny humans like us. Some are magnificent angels that are the size of the sun. The sun is run by an angel, is an angel. It's one of his smallest angels. The sun. The sun is one of the smallest angels that Hashem has. Now go outside tomorrow morning, go look at the sun for two minutes. Go look at his smallest angel, go look at it. I want to see. Let me know how it turned out for you. You can't look at the sun for 20 seconds. Why? Because you're going to start tearing until you go blind. And that's the smallest angel. So Kadosh Baruch Hu has magnificent angels. There are certain uh, different things in the, uh, in the universe. Anyone that looked at pictures of outer space, there's certain images, there's certain uh, things that look like something. There's this huge, enormous image in the uh, sky, the shape of an eye or the shape of a hand. All of these different things are mystical, but they're supernatural beings, if you will. They have a purpose. We have no idea what it is, but they have a purpose. Now, how big are these things? These things are millions, millions of times bigger than Earth. Millions of times bigger than Earth. Now, there is a Bereta that says, Rabbi Akiva says that there is a certain Malach, a certain angel that stands in the middle of the universe. Whatever the middle of the universe means. And its name is Israel. This angel's name is Israel. And on its forehead, it's engraved Israel. What's this angel's job? Every day, he stands glorious, stands in the middle of the universe, and roars, Barechu et Hashem HaMevorach. Tells all of creation, Bless the Shem. May his name be blessed. And all of the angels, all of the creations, say, Baruch Hashem HaMevorach. That's his job. This enormous, enormous thing. That's his job. Why does Hashem have it? Who, what, when, what does he look like? What's his phone number? Maybe he's on WhatsApp. We can message him. That stuff I don't know. What I know is what I just told you. So the point is, Hashem is glorious and is endless. His size is, is, is infinite, is, is, is not even allowed to say. It's literally endless. And His glory, obviously, is, is a, uh, best uh, described to us by His creation. So the more He has, the more it makes Him glorious. So He has different angels, different people. Some people that He has are servants that are black. Some people that He have are servants that are white. Some people that he have are servants that are Chinese. And all types of other servants. You know, where do we learn about, where did they, uh, in Sefer Daniel, we have uh, three tzaddikim that jumped into the fire. Where do they learn to sa- sacrifice their life like that? Now, some people think they learn it from Avraham Avinu. They learn it from the frogs, Chazak Baruch the plague of frogs that we had in Egypt. HaKadosh Baruch at some point told, uh, told, after a week, told the frogs, finished. The second, the second Hashem said finished to the frogs, some frogs chose to go back to the water. But some frogs, with their microscopic brain, said, wait a minute. By the time I'm going to get to the, to, to, to the water, it's going to take me five, ten minutes. You know, you go through the houses, jump on the way. They're not uh, very fast and big and so on. It's going to take a while to get to the river. All that time, I'm not serving Hashem. It's better to jump into the fire that's right next to me and kill myself. Why? Because that way, I'm not violating Hashem's word for that much longer. Because as soon as I'm, I'm, I'm dead, Hashem says, finish to the frogs. He didn't say die. He said, finish, go away. The frog, the frog decided to jump inside the fire to die. Why? Because it'll save time. And it could serve Hashem. From there we learn, that's where our sages, in Sefer Daniel, learn 
to go jump, it's better to go jump into a fire if needed to serve Hashem. So that means that even a frog can serve serves Hashem. Everything serves Hashem. Question is, are we gonna serve Hashem? Next question. In the back, right there. Hot one second, the uh, microphone. In last week's parasha, um, yeah. when Dina was raped, why did it refer to her as Dina Bat Leah instead of Dina Bat Yaakov? When Dina got raped, why is why is uh, Dina called Dina Bat Rivka, not Dina Bat Yaakov? Bat Leah. Bat, bat Leah, not, uh, not Dina Bat Yaakov? Yeah. So, it's a very, very good question. Chazaku Baruch. So, the question is, two things. Number one, why did Dina get raped? Bechlal. So the, the parasha itself says it. Parasha says that Dina made a mistake. Even though her father was Yaakov, a uh, big tzaddik, her mother was a big tzaddikah, Leah, I mean, everything is fantastic. She has a great brother's fantastic life. Everything is good. Dina made a mistake. She wanted to go see what the Goyot were doing. What, 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 is the, uh, what were the Christians doing? What were the Arab girls doing? What are the Palestinians doing? What are all these people doing? Hashem says, oh, you want to go see what they're doing? I'll show you what they're doing. And they raped her. Why? You have no business, no business caring about what everybody else is doing. All you should care about is what Am Yisrael is doing. All you should care about is what Am Yisrael is doing. Now, to do business with Goim, you're allowed. But there are even exceptions for that. There are even exceptions for that. You're not supposed to do business with them right before their holidays lest they take the money and serve their idol with it, and so on and so forth. You have to be nice to them. You can never steal from them. Stealing from a goy is even worse than stealing from a Jew, because it's also Chilul Hashem, and so on and so forth. You need to know how to act with, with, a, uh, with goyim. But one thing, for sure, you're never allowed to be jealous of the biggest goy they have. Why? Every day you wake up, you say, Baruch Hashem, Shalom Asani Goy. Thank you, Hashem, that you didn't make me a goy. Now, Rabbi Aaron Kotler one time asked his Talmidim, who won the election? They had an election in America the day before. And they told him, uh, such and such won the election. He's the new president. But for the Rav, since when do you care about who? Who's the president in America? He goes, no, no, no. When I say the blessing, Baruch Shelo Asani Goy, I want to have the best goy in the world in mind. When I say thank you, Hashem, for not making me the best goy. Why? Because even if you're the worst Jew, but you're serving Hashem, you're better than the best guy they have. So what's the best guy they have right now? Donald Trump, he's the most successful. Uh, Steve Bezos has the most amount of money. Or maybe it's Putin, maybe it's Gates, maybe it's Jehendam, whoever they are. When you say, Baruch Hashem, Shalom Hassani Goy, you're saying, Baruch Hashem, that I'm not Putin. Baruch Hashem, that I'm not Bezos. With $130 billion, not just Bezos the person. Baruch Hashem, I don't have $130 billion. Baruch Hashem. That's what you're supposed to say. So when Dina did not understand this, having such a father like Yaakov, Dina got punished severely. But why did Dina even care about the Goyot? Having such a father. Chachamim say a fantastic, scary chidush. They say... The Kedusha, the Kedusha that comes to a kid comes from both sides. The father and the mother. Yaakov, where did Yaakov come from? Yitzchak. Upachad Yitzchak. Kodesh Kodashim. Who is his grandfather? Avraham. It doesn't get better than that. Where did, where did Leah come from? The Shamirusha, criminals, gangsters, idol worshippers. So even though she herself was a tzaddika, she came from a place of tum'ah. She came from a place of tum'ah and she didn't educate her 100% like Yaakov was doing. And because of that, Dina had eh, a little bit, a little defect, where for a second she thought, what are the Goyo doing? What are the Arabs doing? Not that she was a resha, she was wicked. Bur- no, she's listening to the Torah. Anyone that's mentioning the Torah by name, definitely special. But nonetheless, still, because she came from a bad source, 
and it wasn't the same limud like Yaakov got, that little, that little thing led to her thinking inappropriately, which led to the crime. And that's why it says, Chazak Baruch, that she's the daughter of Leah. Why? She's, in essence, Leah is the reason why she thought about what the Arabs are doing. Not Yaakov. Yaakov was good. Yaakov was good. So that's the difference. When you have kids, Rabotai Karim, before you do, you should watch my shiur called Kosher Intimacy. The shiur, it's only for adults, and it's only for adults that are married. If you're single and you're not an adult, don't watch it. Now, you're going to watch it anyway, because I said don't watch it. But that's going to cause you a lot of damage for watching it. And the reason why is because it's going to make you have all types of thoughts you're not allowed to have when you're single. Now, that's literally going to torture you. It's, if you're going to sin, you're going to lose your olam abba. And if you're not going to sin, you're simply going to torture yourself because now you're thinking about, oh, what's I going to do when I'm married? Why do you want to think about what you're going to do when you're married if you're not married? Why do you want to torture yourself? But if you're married, or you're about to get married, you're like literally a month away or something like that, watch that movie, watch that uh, shiur, it's called Kosher Intimacy, because it talks about the, uh, the details of what kosher intimacy is supposed to look like, but also how much significance... How much significance modesty has even during intimacy? Meaning, even when you're intimate with your wife, you're supposed to be modest. Even during then. I'm not talking about you have to be modest like the goyim think. Some goyim, I remember when I was in public school, Hashem Yachem, the goyim told me, you, you Jewish people, what are you guys, uh, you have like a sheet, a bed sheet, and there's a hole in it? That's what goyim think. These idiots, that's what they think. No such thing. But you're supposed to be intimate. Normal, everything is normal, but you're supposed to be modest. You're supposed to be modest. I speak to you in this language because you're grown-ups. But nonetheless, you need to understand that there's a stereotype that uh, unfortunately uh, people have. People are stupid. So they assume that whatever they saw in uh, some uh, comic, some caricature of Jews is, 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 is true. But nonetheless... There is a high level of, in, of, uh, of uh, uh, modesty expected both by the male and the female. If both the male and the female have modesty during their intimate times, they're guaranteed not only to have, the Rambam writes this in al they're guaranteed not only to have holy kids, but their kids will actually be beautiful. Especially if the male is actually modest. And I'm talking about during the act itself. If they're not modest, they, uh, they're intimate like, uh, like, uh, like uh, donkeys, like some horse does it wherever he wants. They're in a car somewhere, in the movies. They feel like they can do whatever they want, however they want. They're guaranteed that their kids will have major problems. Gaseruach, arrogant, chutzpanim, people that talk back, curse, call their parents by first name. All types of things. Guaranteed. How? Well, might because of how, how it is. Even the time of day is important in Judaism. When you have it. So anyone that's married, highly, highly recommended to watch it seriously with your wife. Watch it seriously with your husband. It's a high level shield. But it will show you the beauty of intimacy in the, uh, in, the, in the Torah. But again, if you're not married, don't watch it. Because it's simply going to lead you either to sin or to torture yourself. Either one is not good. Next question. In the uh, back, please. Good question, by the way. Chazak. See, it's good. You stop with the phone. Good, you stop with the phone. If you, if you want to stay on the phone, you didn't have the uh, such a good question. Chabot. A Jew in today's generation, uh, okay. have they been have they been Jewish in all their previous incarnations, or have we obtained the schut to become Jewish? A uh, very good question. Uh, so the question is that someone that is Jewish today, has he always been Jewish? So the Arizal says in Sharegi Gulim that when a person sins, there are different punishments for the person, aside from Geinom. There's also a place called Kafakela, which the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, the last chapter, talks about that. How the angels that fling the Neshama from one end of the world to the other end of the world, why they beat them up and so on. 
But there's also a different uh, part of punishment that the Arizal talks about, which is reincarnation. Reincarnation is not a reward. Reincarnation is a form of punishment. Now, although this punishment is not very pleasant, nonetheless, punishment is a form of kindness from Hashem. Why? Because what's the alternative? The alternative to this punishment is complete destruction. So it's better to be reincarnated even as a rock, but still have a chance to fix your neshama than to be destroyed completely. So reincarnation happens where a person could literally go to the level, if he ever, if let's say a guy was ever with a non-Jewish woman, and he was intimate with a non-Jewish woman, and he did not do tshuva, before he died, he gets reincarnated as a dog. Many of the dogs you see people walking, they used to be people. Now don't go say, oh no, it's Hadik. Don't call your dog Hadik. But nonetheless, this is real. This is true. Uh, sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. Cats uh, is also a thing. Uh, so, they, so a person could be reincarnated in an animal. A person could be reincarnated in a plant, in a tree, in a fruit, uh, in a rock. There's a pasuk in a Torah that the rocks are screaming. What do you mean the rocks are screaming? There's a pasuk in a Torah, in a Tanakh. The rock is screaming. Do you ever see a rock screaming? Do you ever hear a rock screaming? You can't hear it, but the rocks are screaming. Gemara says actually in Masechet Yoma, when a person cuts a tree, you can't hear it, but the tree is screaming so loud that you can hear it, the scream of the tree until the end of the world. If we were able to hear the screams of the trees, we simply would never ever eat or drink or do anything. If you heard the screams of the tomato, tomato makes when you cut it, orange, cucumber, that you cut it, when you the screams, you'd never eat. You'd kill yourself. So people think that they're vegetarians because they're, they're, uh, they're, they feel bad for the animals. You should feel bad for the tomatoes also. You should feel bad for the uh, orange. You should feel bad for everything. If you really want to feel bad, go feel. Okay, starve to death then. Well, you have more mercy than Hashem. They were created because Hashem created them for a reason, to serve a purpose. Now, one of the other forms of punishment is that a Jew could lose his Judaism. Meaning, a Jew can get punished by being reincarnated as a non-Jew with an obligation to turn back and becoming a Jew. Meaning, their tikkun, the tikkun of this Jew that's now reincarnated as Yoshke, reincarnated as Mustafa, their tikkun in their new life, the way they fix their soul, is by converting back to Judaism. I know one guy who went to a very serious person who says, that's exactly what happened to you in your life. It's exactly what happened to you in your life. That's what you did. You caused, why did he get it? He says, you used to Cause Jews to go away from Hashem. You used to cause people to go away from Hashem. That was your punishment. Now you have to now you have to convert to Judaism, and get people close to Hashem. So point is is that a Jew can uh, lose his Judaism. Now, if he's born a Jew, if he's born a Jew, that means he has been a Jew. Because a goy can never can never reincarnate as a Jew. You have to earn being a Jew. Earn being a Jew is to a conversion according to the Torah, not in accordance with what Hashem uh, decides to do for you in a uh, in Olam Haba. The only way to be to to uh, to become a Jew is either to be born one, or because you're already connected to Mount Sinai, or to connect yourself to Mount Sinai by converting to Judaism during your life. But it is possible the opposite, though, where a Jew can die and be reincarnated as a non-Jew. Very good question. But it happens, unfortunately. It happens. It does, unfortunately. That's actually one of the Chachamim. says that uh, many of the uh, many of the righteous Neshamot, many of the righteous Neshamot being added to Am Yisrael are coming from the conversions. Coming from the conversions. And uh, many converts are uh, a good people. Some are Rishayim, but uh, many of them are Tzadikim. The Gemara says that the uh, converts are like a skin disease for Am Yisrael. Why converts like a skin disease? You're supposed to love them more than you love a, uh, a natural-born Jew. 
So it's converts to like a skin disease for Am Yisrael because number one, if they're uh, good, they show us that we're not doing enough. Natural born Jews not doing enough. The convert is such a tzaddik. The convert is such a tzaddikah. The natural born Jew says, ah, this guy makes me look bad. Why? Because he goes to Minyan at 4 o'clock in the morning to pray for two hours. You're barely showing up for a 9.30 Minyan. He's learning three, four hours in the morning. In the morning. You barely learn three hours the whole week sometimes. So the convert sometimes, Sadiq makes the Jew look bad. Sadiq. But on the other hand, Gemara says, they're also a skin disease when they're bad converts. Why? Because the bad converts cause a lot of damage. Tam Yisrael, most notably being the Erev Rav. Erev Rav were a bunch of fake converts. But the righteous converts are replacing, replacing the Rishayim that have lost their chances. There are certain Rishayim that have gotten several chances from Hashem, several reincarnations, and have never done tshuva. So since Hashem obviously always wants to have a Jewish people, uh, some of these Rishayim are being replaced by converts, righteous converts. So, Be'ezrat Hashem, everybody does tshuva, and it's not uh, necessary for, uh, for Hashem to replace, but rather to just add. But nonetheless, this is also one of the ways that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is delivering on His promise to never destroy His people. He's always going to have new righteous people in the world, even if it means that there's going to be a bunch of people converting. That's where the Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara says that uh, before Mashiach comes, there will be many, many converts, which is actually happening right now. Uh, question over here, back over there, right side. Yeah, if you get the way. Um, why would why would we be told that like, that like all like all the vegetables and stuff like they're, they're, like scream and stuff when you cut in that? Why would we be told that if we if, like we're supposed to eat? Because you have to know that for anything to exist, for anything to exist, it has to have a piece of a shem. For anything to exist, for anything to have life to exist, it has to have a piece of Hashem. When, when you say, en od mil vado, there's nothing else but Him, that's actually literally saying there literally isn't anything but Hashem. There isn't even us. Everything is Hashem. Everything has a piece of Hashem. So for anything to have a piece of life, to have to be living, to exist in the world, has to have a piece of Hashem. The higher the creation, the higher the peace. For example, a Jew has the highest level of a piece of Hashem, if you will. Whereas a uh, non-Jew has a lesser piece. An animal has a lesser piece. A fruit has a lesser piece, and so on and so forth. Now, that creation, although... It's not the same as the highest creation, let's say the Jew. It's still a creation. It's still a living thing. Now, you may not think that the chicken cares if you slaughter it. But I promise you, if the chicken was able to speak English, it tell you, you, you slaughter your mother. Don't slaughter me. Slaughter yourself. What do you slaughter me? What do you want? I don't want it slaughtered. No, but I eat the chicken cutlet, schnitzel, once a week, twice a week. Schnitzel your sister. What do you want to schnitzel me? What are you, you schnitzel. I want to live. I'm going to live to 120. So how come HaKadosh Baruch allows you to commit mass murder on chickens every day? Why? Why are you allowed to commit mass murder on chickens? How come you're not going to trial? In fact, it's a mitzvah for you to eat the chicken if it's kosher and you do a blessing. How come? Because that's what it was created for. That's what it was created for. Now, does that mean that it doesn't hurt the chicken? No, it means it hurts the chicken. But Hashem knows this and still does it. What do you think? The cow is happy to get slaughtered? Oh, Baruch Haba! You're going to slaughter me? No, come on, come on. No, come on. No, come on. No, come on. Right here, right here. Right here where the vein is. What do you think? Do you ever see a, a cow says, No, come on, come on. No, you can do it. I'm kosher. No, no, uh, no cow wants to do it. Does it hurt the cow? Yeah, it hurts the cow. You ever see a slaughter? Even though you're slaughtering it and the cow dies instantly because you're a kosher slaughter, you're disconnecting literally the veins to the, where the, by the time the blood reaches the brain, the, uh, to, to tell it that there's pain, it already dies. Still, the cow, if you ask the cow, in Hebrew, in English, in, uh, in, in Chinese, Yes, listen, you want to be a kosher cow? Cow would tell you, your kids will be kosher cows. What cows? Well, I'm, uh, I'm good, let me live on the grass, I'm eating, I'm drinking, 
I'm having a good time over here. I'm not minding my business. What I do to you? You want to murder me? Go eat apples. So how come Hakadosh Baruch Hu allows it to happen, and nonetheless says it's a mitzvah? Because that's what was created. So what? You don't want to eat a cow anymore because you want to inflict pain on it? Hashem says, don't worry. Even the orange that you want to cut because you're vegetarian also has pain. What? Just because you don't see it and just because you don't hear it doesn't mean it doesn't have pain. What is that to teach us? To teach us that pain is part of life. Pain is part of life. Why? Because everything has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. It's worth it for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to have us go through a certain amount of pain because He needs us to go through a certain amount of pain in order for us to grow. I'll give you an example that's more your language. Every parent that sees their kids struggle wants immediately to save them. You see your kids. Now, I'll ask you a question. Your parents ever help you with homework? Your parents ever help you with homework? Your parents ever help you with anything? What they help you with? Okay, but something that's uh, aside from that. They give you some money? Pay for your stuff. Okay, what if your parents... If, if, if you, now, let's say one day, you're hungry. You said, Abba, Ima, can you give me $10? I want to go get some uh, kosher food. I'm hungry. How come they're going to give it to you? Why don't, they, why don't they tell you, go work, go make your own money? Which means what? They don't. They feel. They feel that if they tell you go work, go make your own money, that's a painful thing, and they want to solve your pain because they care about you, right? Now, parents that help their kids with homework, why? Because they see their kids are struggling. If you could turn on the battery behind the thing, so it doesn't shut off the phone, please. So parents that, that uh, see their kids struggling with something immediately want to solve that struggle. They see the kids struggling with homework, struggling with school, struggling with money. Immediately they want to take away their pain. They'll do their homework for them. They'll give them a bunch of money to go buy food. They'll do a lot of things. They'll, whatever. They, why? Because they cannot handle their kids being in pain. But the truth is, at some point, they have to, if they're good parents, they have to let their kids suffer. If they're good parents, not if they're bad parents. If they're good parents, they have to let their kids suffer. They have to let their kids do their own homework and fail. If that's what it takes for them to realize, they have to study better next time. They have to let their kids struggle and not make ends meet. Miss the rent once or twice and have the landlord bust their chops a few times. To know they have to work harder, they have to be more serious about work and not ask Ima and Abba to, to, to bail you out every time. If the parents are good, they have to allow their kids to struggle. They have to watch their kids in pain at some point. Not right away, but at some point. Why? Because that's the only way you grow. Now that means that the parents have to endure pain. Because it's painful to see your kids in pain. But you have to do it as a good parent. Akadosh Baruch Hu loves us much more than our parents love us. Much more than we love our kids. And still, He puts us in pain every single day. You walk out of the door, your elbow hits the corner. You're in pain. Why is Hashem allowing you to have pain? Part of it is repentance for sin. Part of it is to teach you to be careful next time. You go make business with non-kosher people. Hashem eventually makes those non-kosher people take advantage of you, not just advantage of other people. Teach you what? Why are you going to do all that pain? You're going to lose all that money that you worked hard for. Why? Hashem allows you to do it, do, it, do it in order for you to learn from it. Meaning that in order for Hashem to get us to where He wants us to be, He must allow us to get hurt, to suffer. Because that's the only way we grow. Because pain is very much a very serious part of life that is an important part of our life, if you understand it. If you think that pain simply makes you 
a, uh, uh, a victim, then you don't understand what the meaning of pain is. So everything has a purpose. Pain has a purpose and a very, very important purpose nonetheless. It's a critical purpose. It's actually one of the most important things in creation altogether. No one can ever grow without pain. No one can ever succeed without pain. No one can ever get closer to Hashem without pain. You must have pain in order to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's why there's a term called Mesirut Nefesh. Mesirut Nefesh means self-sacrifice. What self-sacrifice? The highest form of pain. The highest form of pain is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. That's why the entire Torah, from Bereshit all the way to the end, is the experiences of people enduring pain and connecting to Hashem with that pain and through that pain. So we learn that these creatures that we eat have pain because we need to learn that that pain, Hashem is aware of it and He wants you to be aware of it. So you learn from it that it's, pain is not a bad word. It's not a negative thing if you understand what it means. It's only a negative thing if you don't understand what it means. If you knew that you breaking your hand is going to save you from five years of Gehenom for some sin that you did, are you going to still say, Ow? Or are you going to say, Hashem, break the other hand too? Why? Because now you understand the value of this pain. You understand the value of this pain. If you knew that you were losing all your money, you worked hard for it. You worked 60 years to have money. You think you're finally going to retire. Somebody shows up, robs you for everything you have in one second. Now, of course, this is traumatizing. If you're like some of these people in the world, they commit suicide. But if you understand the value of pain, you know that Hashem taking all of your money simply took away a large part of your genome, if not all of it. Because it's like Mama's death penalty. If you knew that this money loss meant Hashem just removed 5,000 years of Gehenom, what are you going to say to Hashem? Why did you do it sooner? Thank you. I'm going to have Sudat Odaya. Thank you dinner for Hashem for, for, for losing all my money. What's the difference between the guy that cries over losing his money and the guy that uh, thanks Hashem for losing his money? Both of them endured pain. The difference is one understands the value of pain, one doesn't understand the value of pain. Now, one second. If someone forgot to say Asher Yatsar after using the bathroom and only remembers he forgot an hour later, can he or she still say it? And the second question is, what if a convert isn't fully religious? Okay, I'll answer both of them quickly. If someone forgot whether they did a blessing or not, like you uh, just uh, ate, but you forgot whether you blessed it or not, because blessings are rabbinical, we judge a leniently, and therefore you do not do a blessing. And the reason why is because to a blessing, if you miss it, it's a rabbinical sin. But doing two blessings, meaning if you said it already, and saying it again, is saying Hashem's name in vain. And that's a biblical sin. So it's better to make a rabbinical sin, in case you didn't say it, than to make a biblical sin and say it twice. So if you've ever forgotten whether you blessed something or you prayed or not, you don't pray. You don't do the blessing. On the other hand, if you forgot, but then you remembered, you forgot, you know that you forgot, but then you remembered an hour later, you can still do the blessing. It's 72 minutes. An hour is usually 60 minutes. You have 72 minutes. But if, uh, if you're not a... Uh, 100% sure, or even more time has passed, let's say an hour and a half has passed, go to the bathroom again, even if it's a very little bit, and do the blessing and have the kavanah that this blessing is for both. Now, second question is, what if a convert isn't fully religious? A convert that is, isn't fully religious, it depends when they became not fully religious. If they weren't fully religious on day one, meaning they didn't keep Shabbat on day one, that means that they're not a convert. There's still a goy. There's still a goya. If, let's say, the woman came and went into the mikveh, Maria, and she already in her mind knew that she's not going to keep Shabbat. Even though she changed her name legally to Sarah, she's still Maria. In Shemaim, she can fool everybody else. Not anyone else. In Shemaim, she can't fool anyone. 
Here she could fool the Bedin, she could fool her husband, she could fool her mother and her brother and everybody else, but in reality she stole 100% of Goya. But if initially she was keeping Shabbat and mitzvot, but then as the way would happen, a year later, five years later, ten years later, she started getting weaker. She stopped keeping Shabbat Hashem Yechem. Then she simply considered a secular Jew, which is obligated to do tshuva. And if she doesn't, she's going to be declared as the dumbest person that ever existed. In Genom. In Genom, she'll have two punishments. One is Genom. And two, everyone else in Genom calling her stupid. Why? Because she wasn't obligated to do it when she was born. Why'd you convert if you're not going to be religious? If you want to drive on Shabbat, stay at Goya. You don't have to convert. No one's obligated you to convert. If you're going to convert, convert because you want it. Convert for the right reasons. Oh, I converted because I love him. Oh, you converted for somebody. That's already a problem. That's already a problem. Whether it's a real conversion, really not, that's already a big machloket. A very, very big problem. But nonetheless, a person that just falls off the derech because of different tests and so on has to do tshuva, and they're considered a secular Jew. A secular Jew, Hashem Yerachem Alem, may they all do tshuva. Next question. In the uh, back over there. Is it a mitzvah to, Wait, yeah, to get pleasure in this world? Is it a mitzvah to get pleasure in this world? It's a two-part answer. Because if, if it is, then would smoking weed be like a mitzvah? Ooh, wow. What a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Gemara in Maseret Rosh Hashanah, page 16, says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides what type of Parnassah you're going to get on Rosh Hashanah. Decides what type of Parnassah you're going to get on Rosh Hashanah. But what does Parnassah mean? Does it only mean money? No. Parnassah means more than just money. Parnassah also means the fun times you're going to have in this life. So a certain weight of fun you're going to have. Now, so Hashem wants you to have joy in this world. In fact, there's a Gemara that says that if a person does not enjoy certain things, he'll get punished for not enjoying them. Why would why did you not enjoy this? Meaning that there is a certain amount of joy that Hashem wants you to have. That's why He made intimacy joyful. He wants you, even though the mitzvah of reproduction and also the mitzvah of being with your wife is a mitzvah from the Torah. They're both mitzvot of the Torah. They're both actually in your ketubah. Nonetheless, Hashem made it fun. I mean, imagine it wasn't fun. No one would have any kids. One generation, everybody dies. Why? Because to have a kid is difficult. No one would want to have a kid. If uh, a lot of things that we do weren't fun, we wouldn't do them. Imagine, uh, you know, imagine that uh, certain things were not fun. Imagine there was no colors. Everything was gray. So certain things would lose their value and we would lose their desire. So Hashem made a certain amount of joy in the world and He wants you to enjoy it. But He wants to enjoy it in a kosher way. Meaning, if you enjoy it in a kosher way, no problem. You're enjoying the world as you're supposed to. But if you're enjoying things in a non-kosher way, then that will take away from the kosher joy you're supposed to have. Meaning, if let's say you are intimate with your wife, that's a kosher enjoyment. Kadosh Baruch says, Alainu al-arasi, you can do whatever you want, enjoy it, your wife, it's kosher, she's Torah, Baruch Haba, it's mitzvah, mitzvah to do it. Have as much of it as you want during the kosher times. But if he's wasting seed... HaKadosh Baruch says, ah, you're wasting seed, then you're getting a certain amount of pleasure from the seed, from this, oh, no problem, I'm going to take it away somewhere else. How? I'm going to take away money from you, I'm going to take away the zivug from you, I'm going to take away mazal from you, all of the other things you were supposed to enjoy, I'm going to take those away from you. Why? Because you wasted seed uh, one time this week, on purpose, not on accident, on purpose. So you enjoyed, and Hashem took away the joy from somewhere else. So now, there's a joy, called smoking drugs. Now, drugs come in different forms. Sometimes it's marijuana, sometimes it's crack, sometimes it's cocaine, ecstasy, acid, mushrooms, a lot of stuff. I had a lot of friends that were drug dealers and drug, fr- and drug addicts. And I actually had a few employees that I paid for their rehab. But, oh, Hashem, I never did drugs in my life because I like my brain. But that doesn't mean I don't know anything about them. Now, all of these drugs, Rabotai, 
all of these drugs are 100% forbidden. Why are they forbidden? Why are they forbidden? Because, I know you have the answer, because you saw the Shehovah drugs. Allah Moshe Feinstein, Allah Shalom, says, Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid. You have an obligation in the Torah. One of the commandments is that you have to think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is next to you at all times. The King of Kings. Melech Malchei Amlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu is next to you at all times. Which means you have to be ready to meet Him at all times. At all times. No exceptions. A person that intentionally changes their mental status from normal to abnormal. Because of the use of elective drugs, whether it be pills, or it be marijuana, or, or the other drugs that I mentioned, Rav Moshe Feinstein says, according to the Torah, he's supposed to get a death penalty on the spot. Because he's judged as a ben sorer more. That's what he's judged as. A wayward child that gets a death penalty. Smoking marijuana one time. Ecstasy one time. It's all the same. In Shemaim, there's no like the government... Oh, marijuana, only a year, a year of probation. Cocaine, no, that's two years in jail. Crack, we're just going to leave you there. We're going to leave you in jail forever. No, 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 my friends. In Shemaim, all drugs are the same, if they're elective. Now, what about if you're taking for medicinal reasons, which means really only one of those drugs you can take for medicinal reasons, or two, let's say painkillers and, uh, and uh, marijuana. Now, if there is a drug that's available to handle your pain, let's say if a person has cancer, or uh, all types of uh, problems with their bones, or so on, and they need something for pain. If there is a pain management system that does not alter your mind, you're obligated to take that one. But if that one doesn't work for you, simply it doesn't work, your body doesn't react to it, then you are allowed to try the other ones like marijuana, and, uh, and, the, and the pills and so on. But if there is one that, is a, uh, that doesn't alter your mind, you're obligated to use that one. Now, the reality is, in places like California where they made uh, uh, marijuana mitzvah, uh, over there, people say everybody's sick. Everybody's sick. Everybody is sick. Everybody has a card. Everybody has a sick card. 25 years old, sick. 35 years old, sick. Everybody's sick. Everybody's sick to get the drugs because they want to make this mitzvah. There's such tzaddikim over there. So now... If you really are sick, but you're still religious, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it a way for you. How? CBD. CBD doesn't get you high. If you need the chemicals that come from the plant to help your pain, you can still get the chemicals without altering your state of mind, which means you could take CBD in different ways, through cake, cookies, toothpaste, a million different ways, that you could have it without getting high. Which means, if you're still getting high, it has nothing to do with pain, Baba. It has nothing to do with pain. It has nothing to do with any mitzvah. It's your rasha, your merusha. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to punish you. He's going to punish you for it. Why? Because you didn't believe that he was next to you. You didn't believe it was next to you. You didn't do shiviti Hashem. You thought Hashem created the world, but he's in Jamaica. He's on vacation. Maybe smoking hashish with you. <laughs> you thought Hashem is like you. And that's why Kadosh Baruch Hu says, you thought I was like you. Now you're going to say I'm not like you. Pasuk in the Torah. You thought I was like you, I'm not like you. That's why Rabotai. You want to be a Jew? A kosher one? All those drugs, you have to get them out of your system. Why? Every single time you take inhale, marijuana, you take a pill, you do any of that stuff, you're altering your mind, you, my friend, are making a sin from the Torah, not from the rabbis, from the Torah. It's like eating pig. Yeah, but I like it. Okay, so you'll like Gainum too. What can I tell? I'm just telling you what's allowed, what's not allowed. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you. Do what you want. It doesn't, doesn't change my life. It changes your life. But I can tell you for sure that there are major, major problems with people that consume drugs. And one of the major problems is the fact that they simply get used to a life that's not reality. 
where normal life becomes insufficient for them. They enjoy being high so much that not being high is no longer tolerable for them. And it requires for them to adjust their life because all of the fun that they remember is when they were high. So now if you tell them, listen, come to Shul, it'll be fun. Like, what, the, the rabbi smokes, smokes on stage? No, no, no. Oh, he takes pills? He's a good rabbi, this guy. No, no, no pills. Why? He does lines while he's giving his Shul Torah? No, there's no drugs, chamo. There's no drugs. Shul Torah, your neshama, will be elevated from the Shul Torah. The guy's like, I'm going to have fun like that, just listening to Shul Torah for two hours? How can that be fun? He doesn't understand. He cannot connect fun and Torah. Why? Because all the fun he's gotten himself used to has come in the form of drugs. Same thing will come for marriage. The person, the person is going to get married one day, and his wife says, uh, "Honey, let's go have fun on uh, on a vacation. Let's go have fun on a vacation." So he thinks that when he's packing, he's supposed to be packing his drugs too, because that's the fun. So when he gets arrested at the airport and goes to jail for ten years, and he can't see his kids anymore, it's like, "Well, I was just having fun." Okay, you have fun, no problem. Have fun with Steve and Jose in cell number eight. So, everybody knows drugs are not good. You don't have to be a genius. No drug addict in the world will ever tell you, I made the right decision by starting to smoke pot. No drug addict in the world will ever tell you that he thought he was going to become a drug addict. No drug addict ever thought for a second that it's possible for him to get a, become a drug addict. But guess what? They all did. And they all started just like the average person. Smoking a cigarette, a little pipe, a little weed, a little this, a little that. Before you know it, they're going like this every day. Junkies. Complete junkies. And they cannot live without it. They cannot live without it. And they have to go to rehab and kill themselves and almost die in order to hopefully, maybe, one day, have a regular life. And even then, it's almost impossible because of how much damage these drugs do on your brain. So that's the key. If you want to ruin your life, do drugs. You want Ganom in this world? Enjoy drugs too. You want Gan Eden? Understand that you do not need drugs and it's also a sin to do them. All forms of drugs. Whether it's marijuana or it's pills or even if it's a legal drug. Like whether the government makes it legal or not doesn't make it allowed. Just so you guys understand. The government's rules are completely irrelevant to the Torah. Completely irrelevant. If the government's rules agree with the Torah, good. If the government's rules contradict the Torah, we're not allowed to listen to the government's rules. You're not allowed to violate the Torah for the sake of government. Like if the government said it, you're allowed to kill once a year, you're still not allowed to kill. Why? The Torah says you're not allowed to kill. So even if the government says you're allowed to smoke drugs and inhale them and eat them and, and whatever you want, put them in your eyes for all I care. They tell you to do that, you're still forbidden. Why? It alters your state of mind and it puts you in a status of someone that deserves a death penalty. Hashem doesn't want to kill his kids. Why are you putting them in that position? Why are you putting them in that position? Next question. And right here, over here, in the front. And then we'll get to the one in the back. Pass the mic, please. What about alcohol? There's some, like for example, Purim, where you're supposed to drink. When you drink, you're altering your state of mind that you can't greet Hashem. Right. Or so, no, so the way you're supposed to uh, drink on Purim is not, does not mean that you're supposed to drink that way the whole year. There's a mitzvah to drink if you can tolerate it, and you know how to serve Hashem with, with that mitzvah. So the Gemara Masechet Megillah says you're supposed to drink so you do not know who Mordechai is and who Haman is. So the Chachamim say, what does it mean you don't know who Haman is and who's Mordechai? Meaning that you understand that it wasn't because of Haman that, Hashem, that uh, we almost died, and it wasn't because of Mordechai that we're still alive. It's because of Hashem. Everything is because of Hashem. So that's really the mitzvah. You're supposed to drink to elevate your status and get closer to Hashem through that drinking once a year. But if your drinking simply gets you closer to becoming a criminal, 
that drinking gets you closer to becoming a loser, that drinking gets you closer to becoming a, a, a sinner, a rasha, you're not allowed to drink. You're not allowed to drink. You're not allowed to drink and act a fool in the, in the, in the streets and uh, walk, run around naked thinking, oh, it's mitzvah, mitzvah, it's purim. You're not allowed to do that. That's chilul Hashem. If you know how to serve Hashem and elevate your neshama through the drinking, no problem. But if you're one of these people that's a complete mess, disaster, and uh, starts falling all over himself in the shul, thinks he's allowed to pray, you're not allowed to drink. So, but again, even that is only once a year. The rest of the year, you're not allowed to get drunk for no reason. There's, not, there's no permission to allow you to get drunk. You're allowed to have a drink. You're not allowed to get drunk. Because drunk alters your state of mind completely. Having a drink, for example, if your person has a buzz, he had a lechaim, he had a uh, something like that, that's not altering your state of mind. It may make the person more calm to a certain extent, but it's not altering his state of mind to the point where he loses control. But still, again, even that, a person needs to be careful with. The Gemara in Masechet Yoma says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves a few different types of people. One of those people is a person who doesn't get drunk at all. At all, ever. Hashem loves them. Hashem gives them special love. Why? Because that means that that person will constantly have Hashem on, in mind. Me personally, for example, I don't drink uh, alcohol pretty much the whole year, including uh, Purim. Not because I'm some big tzaddik, but just because I hate it. Uh, I used to like alcohol, but my body changed over the last uh, 15 years. And uh, for some reason, I lost the taste. Kadosh Baruch apparently wanted me to uh, hate alcohol. And for me, to drink alcohol is suffering. So for me to, uh, to drink on Purim will be suffering for me. Can't do it. I'll, I'll drink uh, grape juice. Grape juice, maybe I'll take a sip of wine. To, I don't get drunk. Next question. You have a question right there? Yeah. Why is there no letter of the son of J in the Hebrew alphabet? Why is there no letter? Yeah, like A, B, C, D, like Aleph, Bev, Bev. There's no J in the Hebrew alphabet. Oh, there's no letter that's J? Yeah. What do you mean? Like like uh, J like Jose? Like uh, the J sound, like the uh, J like, sound. The J? Well, it's Gimel. Gimel with an apostrophe. That's not a J. No, uh, 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 Gimel, uh, Gimel it has uh, every letter. Every letter has... One second. Not everybody is proficient in, in, uh, in uh, the Hebrew language. Myself included. Uh, but uh, there are different letters that, are, that can make different sounds. Not just the typical O, A, E. There are certain letters that can actually change the sound themselves. Like, for example, Gimel uh, is, is one of those letters that you could uh, change the sound with a uh, certain uh, like apostrophe, it looks like, uh, where it uh, becomes that. But again, there is a, uh, uh, the Hebrew language is not like English. It's not like Latin. It's not like uh, the other languages. The Hebrew language is the language that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world with. It's the DNA of the world. Uh, the other languages, although they were also created by Hashem, Hashem gave people the idea to create them, if you will, uh, still they are, they are uh, like descendants of Hebrew. But uh, Hebrew is the, is the mother language of the world. That's how the world was created. That was the original language and the only language that existed until the Tower of Babel, which means the first 1650 years of this world. The only language that existed was Hebrew. Only during the Tower of Babel, which is at the end of Parashat Noach, did uh, Hashem bring 70 other languages to the world. In the back, they have a question, I think, right? Did I answer it, or do you guys want the question? You have a question still in the back? No? No question? Okay, so right now. Do miscarriage babies come, come back by Tchiras Mesa? So the, uh, the, uh, Sharei Gilgulim says that, uh, and the Gemara also talks about it, that uh, reincarnation is part of the measure for measure system that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world with, meaning that if a person steals, Hashem doesn't just punish that person with a uh, genom. He's also punished in this world where uh, a person that steals, someone will steal from them. And not just they will lose the money. And the reason why is because part of the measure for measure, for it to be exact, 
it's not enough for them to just lose money if they stole money. They also have to have the feeling of embarrassment, shame, agony, and so on that comes with being robbed. So someone that steals, someone would, would steal from them. But if they died already, before Hashem punished them for that stealing, uh, they will be reincarnated and someone would steal from them in their reincarnation. Meaning that some of the things that we suffer for in this life is for sins we committed in our previous carnation. Now, a person that has an abortion on purpose, he got a girl pregnant, but he doesn't want to marry her. Or she got pregnant, but she doesn't want to marry him. And she goes and decides to have an abortion. She's committing murder, 100% murder. And if she doesn't do complete shuva for that murder, she will have to come back as an abortion. She will have to come back as a baby that someone else is killing inside their mother's stomach. And anyone that wants the details of what happens, I could send you some interesting videos of what happens to the kid inside the mother's belly when the murderer that calls himself a doctor from places like Planned Parenthood decides to chop him up into little pieces before he vacuums him. Now, this is graphic for a reason. To explain to you guys that murder doesn't matter how big the baby is and doesn't matter if you can see the baby or not. The fact that the baby is inside the body doesn't mean it's not alive. Once the baby is 40 days old, it's 100% alive. It's no different than you and me. So killing the baby two, three, four, five months after a person got pregnant just because it's inconvenient for your life is a very serious problem. Now what happens to a person that does it? Like I said, they get punished with it. Now what happens to a, a miscarriage, for example? That's a baby that's, in essence, that was supposed to come to the world but didn't. But it wasn't necessarily because, always because of the mother or the father's reason. Sometimes it is because of abusive people, abusive behavior and so on. But sometimes it's just simply Hashem didn't want it to happen. Where that, that neshama didn't, wasn't supposed to come to the world. It wasn't supposed to come to the world. Uh, it was only supposed to exist for a certain amount of time in the belly, for a month, for two months, for five months, for whatever it was, but not enough. Why? Because its tikkun was to only exist for that amount of time. Point being is that the reincarnation is a very, very precise that we could never even imagine, the details, but we can imagine enough to understand uh, that it's, a, uh, it's very much real and it's very much important for us to... Uh, uh, delve into it. Next question. In the back? Oh, front? Okay. We're almost down. Maybe one or two questions and we're finished. How powerful is uh, huh? how powerful is uh, music? How powerful is music? Yeah. Um, how powerful is music? So I actually released a clip a few days ago that uh, discussed this where uh, the Chachamim say in the Gemara that uh, the, uh, the voice of a woman is considered nakedness to a man meaning that a Jewish male is not allowed to listen to a woman singing and the reason why is because naturally the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu created males is that if you listen to a woman singing, you automatically think of her naked. And that's a forbidden thought. Now, showing us that the voice or sound and music and so on has an impact on us. Now, the David Melech had a note in music that does not exist in the world anymore. No one knows it. Uh, but he had a note that he was able to play in order to elevate his serving of Hashem, elevate his prayer to the highest form of serving of Hashem. Meaning that a person can serve Hashem uh, through music and in uh, in, in prayer combined in the highest form that exists. But if the person's music is not kosher, for example, if it's uh, full of vulgarity, you know, uh, swear words, it's uh, immodesty, arrogance and the like which is rock and roll hip-hop and pretty much everything that's out there that has lyrics if a person listens to that stuff he's not only damaging his neshama 
but also he's damaging his blessing in the world. Because the Chachamim say that if a person either listens or speaks a curse, a swear word, he can lose 70 years of blessings. Just for one curse word. Just for one swear word in a, uh, in a gangster rap uh, video. Now, the video that I released, you'll notice that a few people wanted to tear my head off for it. And the reason why is because I said that uh, you're not allowed to, uh, to listen to uh, this hip-hop and all of these lyrical music, that's, uh, that's this junk that people listen to today. You're not allowed to listen to it, which people didn't have a problem with. What do they have a problem with? They had a problem with the fact that I said that you're allowed to listen to an artist named Nisim Black. Because he's a Jewish artist, he's a convert, that uh, is a righteous convert, that raps. But he raps about Hashem. So he uses this impure uh, uh, talent, or this talent that he has, that used to be used for impure ways, in a pure way. And a few overly zealous people that decided that I'm wrong. No, people that rap, they're like gangsters, no, it's disgusting music. Yes, I agree with you. If you rap or you rock and roll or you whatever, you, you uh, sing Middle Eastern music, I don't care. If you speak with vulgarity, with immodesty, with arrogance, then it's not allowed. doesn't matter what the genre is. But if you don't, if you speak about Hashem in a kosher way, what's the problem? Music is not supposed to be something that everyone likes. Some people will like it, some people will not like it. The point being, Rabotai, is that Alakha is not made based on everybody's taste. Alakha, the law of the Torah, is based on, based on what's allowed, what's not allowed. To simply think that something is not allowed or allowed because you agree or disagree with it you prefer it or not prefer it simply means you know zero, absolutely zero about the Torah and in fact you probably know less than people that don't study Torah. Why? Because the people that don't study Torah have never studied before, they have an excuse why they don't know. You don't have an excuse, you've been studying. So how come you still don't know? The answer is your arrogance got in the way. Your arrogance got in the way where you agreed and you like everything as long as it agrees with your predisposition, as long as it agrees with your existing opinion. But the second that the Torah comes and disagrees with your opinion, all of a sudden, no, no, it cannot be that this is the Torah. It cannot be. It cannot be. And these overzealously people commit chilul Hashem, lashon hara, rechilut, every sin under the sun, public embarrassment, what? In the name of a Torah! That's how stupid people are. That's how dumb people are. They think they're making a mitzvah by simply deciding, no, no, this is not allowed. Why? Because I don't like it. That's not how Alakha works. Alakha doesn't work that way. And you have to be strong when it comes to this because unfortunately what's happened is that people think that being zealous means that you're righteous, no matter how zealous you are. That's completely wrong. Being zealous is critical. But even more critical than zealousness is humility. If your zealousness does not come with humility attached to it, you are not zealous, you're arrogant. And you just like telling people what to do. You like telling people that you're right. But if you're zealous but humble, then that's mitzvah. How do you know you're zealous and humble? That you will fight to defend the Torah on rules you disagree with. Meaning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you're not allowed to marry this such and such person. Why? He says, not allowed. And you disagree with it. Why? Because it hurts you. Because you think it should be allowed. You're really zealous? You're going to defend that rule. Why? Because it doesn't matter if you agree with it, you nothing. It doesn't matter if you like it. You didn't write the Torah. You're not the author of the Torah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the author of the Torah. 
You don't tell him what to do. If you're truly zealous and humble, you're going to defend the Torah strongly on things you completely disagree with. And you will admit that you are nothing in comparison to the Torah. You're never going to be one of these people that says, yeah, I hear what the rabbis say, but I don't agree with it. You chamor, you donkey. You publicly say you disagree with Tamit Chacham? Who are you, Bechlal? Who are you? Why? Because you watched a few shurim. You feel you have, you have the right, Bechlal, to defend, to go against Tamidei Chachamim? You have the right to go defend something that's written in a book 5,000 years? You, your little opinion? That's the difference. In today's world, Rabotai, people think that being zealous is a mitzvah by default. So what do they want to do? They want to cancel everyone. How? Nothing's allowed. Nothing's not allowed to eat, not allowed to look, not allowed to see, not allowed to get out of bed, not allowed to live. You shouldn't breathe even. It's a sin that you're breathing. It's a sin that you're, you're allowed to, you're walking. It's a sin that you're thinking for yourself. It's a, everything's a sin. That doesn't mean that you are zealous. It means you're an idiot. Any idiot can tell you that everything is not allowed. But only a Talmit Chacham will tell you what's allowed, even if it doesn't make sense to you. The Talmit Chacham will find ways for things to be allowed according to the Torah and forbid things that are not allowed, regardless of his taste, regardless of your tastes. Why? Because there's Torah Temet. And that's why you have to speak very strongly against people that think that they are smarter than the Torah. That they are smarter than Tamit Chachamim. That toil and toil over Torah day and night. Why? Because it disagrees with their opinion. Who is your opinion, Bechlal? Who cares about your opinion? You think the world cannot exist with your opinion? Who cares about your opinion? It's very important you guys understand. There's a very, very clear key ingredient in forming the right ideology because sometimes people will pretend to be righteous and zealous by simply canceling everybody else out they hate everybody that's not like them that's not being righteous that's being a rasha arrogant a naval birshut the torah it's called despicable in the name of the torah and those people need to do tshuva very very strong tshuva their tshuva sometimes is more difficult than someone that's completely blank, never did a mitzvah in his life. Why? Because they think they're righteous. Their arrogance is so big, they think they're righteous. And that's why I have to speak so strongly about it, even though I care about those people too. Because th- to break their shell is much, much more difficult than to break a shell of a chiloni, a person that's completely secular, doesn't know Aleph Bet Bechlal. Much more difficult to break the shell of an arrogant person. So it's very, very critical we know. Your ideology is only right if your ideology constantly bows its head to the Torah, for the Torah, with a source, not your opinion. A source. Before you state your opinion, you have to think a million and a half times. Someone asked the Chafetz Chaim, how do you make Allah? You wrote the Mishnah Bura. Who are you to write a Allah Mishnah Bura? How do you decide what Allah is? The Chafetz Chaim says After I review all of the poskim that discuss this issue, any issue that he wrote about, which is pretty much the entire Torah, after I review all of the poskim 36 times each, then I, I, I write the Allah. After I look at the opinion of every single person that wrote about this law, of Netilat Yedayim, of watching your eyes, of saying Lashon Hara, of going to the bathroom, of, of eating, of drinking, of, of being with your wife, of having kids, every law, after I look at every single posek that ever discussed this 36 times, then I'll write it. Then I'll write what the Allah is. How many poskim did you study, Mr. Zealous? How many poskim did you study? How many times? Do you even know what a posek is, Bichlal? Do you know what a psak alakha looks like? And that's the funny thing. 
most of these people have never even opened a book of Alachot before. They have no idea what right or left is, but they decide that their opinion is so valuable, they make public comments on the internet, these keyboard warriors, and make a public chilul Hashem. And only in the embarrassment that they get from my words right now is going to maybe, maybe help them undo the chilul Hashem they did in the last few days. Because that Rabotai is a very, very critical mistake people make. They think that if you hate people, that means you're righteous. Guess what? If you were right, we wouldn't be allowed to talk to you either. You wouldn't be allowed to do Kiruv. You wouldn't be allowed to help anybody. Why? Most people, what are they? They came from Abu Dazara. Either Abu Dazara Mamash, like Christianity or Abu Dazara of some other form of religion, or there were idol worshippers that were going against the Torah in different ways. So if we were really, really strict, according to the letter of the law, like they want, then we would go by the Rambam that says, someone that's obeyed Abu Dazara, mean, apikos, and so on, now let me within six feet of him, needless to say, speak to him. But they don't look at themselves. They look at everybody else that's not doing the one mitzvah that they're doing. Very important to know. Zealousness is only kosher if it's connected to humility. Humility is only there if you are going to fight and defend the mitzvot that you disagree with. Why? Because that's the law. That's the law. And the law is much more valuable than your opinion. Bezat Hashem will continue this discussion and more next week. We're back on Sunday. Uh, next week is Hanukkah, by the way. One of the days we're going to have movie night. We'll bring the big screen and show you guys a nice film that could change your life. Amen.